Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for the Tech Guy is provided by Cashfly. C A C H E F L Y dot com. Hi, this is Leo Laporte, and this is my Tech Guy podcast. This show originally aired on the Premier Radio Networks on Sunday, October 7th, 2012. This is episode 916. Enjoy. The Tech Guy podcast is brought to you by Ring Central. I love our phone system from Ring Central. Cloud based, zero startup costs, and Ring Central is just $20 a month per user. Try it now with a 30 day risk free trial. And when you buy one desk phone, you'll get a second phone free, up to 20 phones. Call 800-543-9980 or visit ringcentral.com and use our promo code TWIT. And buy ting.com. Ting is a new mobile phone service that makes sense. Save money with Ting. Pay for what you use. It doesn't require a contract, and it offers unlimited devices on one pooled plan. Ting's the thing. To save $50 on your first Ting device, visit techguy.ting.com. And buy Gazelle, the fast and simple way to sell your iPhone, iPad, MacBook, or Android smartphone. Find out what your gadget's worth and get cash to upgrade to the latest iPhone at Gazelle. Dot com. Well, hey, 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 how are you today? Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. It's time to talk computers, the internet, cell phones, camcorders, MP3 players, home theater, digital photography, anything that's on your mind, anything that has a chip in it. 8888 Ask Leo is my phone number if you want a question. Or a comment or a suggestion, 888-827-5536. That's toll-free from anywhere in the U.S. outside the U.S. Use Skype for some similar product, and you should be able to call and get into the show. 8888-ASK-LEO. Well, you've heard about the MAPS fiasco, and I use that word in quotes, with the uh, iPhone 5. It's a, you know, it's, it's just... A maps program, and you can replace it, as Apple quickly pointed out, with other maps programs. But now there's the purple flare problem. <laughs> when you sell a lot of anything, uh, you get a lot of attention. And if there's a flaw, however minor, you're going to get a lot of attention. And I always have said that when there's a problem with, uh, there's always going to be problems with technology. Really, the question is not, are there problems? The question is, how does the company respond? You know, how quickly do they respond? How effectively do they respond? Do they, do they make it good? Do they make it right? This is not, this is even, a, to my mind, but you, you certainly can correct me, but to my mind, this is even less of an issue than the Maps issue. Soon after the release of the iPhone 5, people started noticing when they took pictures and there was a light in the corner a bright light source, that there'd be a purple flare or halo around the light source. And in fact, I don't think it's unique to the iPhone. In fact, I think most uh, phones, certainly this is a Sony camera chip, and any phone using this Sony camera chip, and there are many, will have, I think, the same problem. So it's not, it's really more of, a, it's not that this is a big issue, uh, Although, you know, if, if, if Apple, and I think Apple does, wants you to replace your point-and-shoot camera with a, an iPhone, and I think people want to do that, then this is something you've got to address. You may be fixed down the road. You can't fix it now, I don't think. So um, if you complain to Apple, you might get an email like this. This came from an Apple support staff. Our engineering team just gave me this information, and we recommend... That you point the camera away from the light source when taking pictures. <laughs> You're pointing it wrong. <laughs> the purple flare in the image provided is considered normal behavior for the iPhone's camera. Now there's a, a public support doc. That was a private email to an individual. Passed it along to uh, MacRumors.com. Now there's a... If you go to... Uh, Apple's support site, you'll, you can find this. 
Most small cameras, including those in every generation of iPhone, may exhibit some form of flare at the edge of a frame when capturing an image with out-of-scene light sources, especially really bright ones like the sun and so forth. This can happen when a light source is positioned at an angle, usually just outside the field of view, so that it causes a reflection off the surfaces inside the camera module and onto the camera sensor. So see, it's not going into the sensor. It's, it's, it's bouncing off the edges and bouncing into the sensor. Moving the camera slightly to change the position in which the bright light is entering the lens or shielding the lens with your hand should minimize or eliminate the effect. Yeah, I, and actually, that's exactly right. In fact, I, I, you know, this is every camera I've ever had has had this uh, problem, and 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 f camera phones uh, worse probably than most because these are cheap cameras. And surely you've remember taking a picture and putting your cupping your hand around the sensor to block the light beaming in there. It's just normal. <laughs> the iPhone four didn't have that problem says uh, somebody in our chat room, M. Lewis. It's true, the iPhone 4 didn't have the purple problem. It had a different problem. In fact, the iPhone's famous for its lens flares and its unique-looking lens flares. I remember for many years, the iPhone, maybe not the 4, but the, certainly the 3 and the original iPhone, uh, the lens flare would be like blobs going down the screen. It's a cheap camera. It's not a point-and-shoot. It's certainly not a, an SLR. But the Apple's response <laughs> kind of cracks me up a little bit. <laughs> Just point it somewhere else. <laughs> Here, see, this is you know the the worst. Unfortunately, the worst blot on the Apple escutcheon, the worst public relations issue for Apple, uh, came uh, with Antenna Gate, right? Where this is where, and the original iPhone four was, if you uh, if you you could actually hold the phone and watch the bars go from five to zero, because you could cover up the antenna because of that metal band around the iPhone, which by the way is gone on the iPhone 5. Uh, they don't do it that way, I guess, anymore. But uh, the response at the time was to ignore the complaints, which were loud, and I among them. Steve Jobs was in Hawaii. This story is told in uh, Walter Isaacson's biography of Steve Jobs. He said, finally said, all right, all right. He flew back. He brought his son, which is kind of cool. He said, son, you should watch this. This is going to be a lesson in business. Went back, big board meeting, or meeting of advisors or whatever executives at Apple, and they went hashed it back and forth, and finally they acknowledged they had a they had a press conference, and they acknowledged yes, there's something wrong with it, but Steve said something <laughs> was a kind of a mistake. <laughs> his initial response, I think this was an email to somebody who complained to this, said you're holding it wrong, <laughs> and has that not now filtered into the consciousness? Is this not the uh, the the joke that people make when something like this purple flag? You're holding it wrong. It is, isn't it? And that's how you can measure whether the lasting effect of a... Uh, everybody makes mistakes. Every company has problems with technology. It's how they respond. Apple's response was to give people a free bumper case. Somebody pointed out that there are no bumper cases for the iPhone 5. Apple obviously didn't want you to have... In fact, Apple doesn't make any cases, do they, for the iPhone 5? They want you to, to experience the iPhone in all of its beauty and glory. But what's the first thing people do when they get an iPhone? They get a case. Now, I'm looking. Now, we have a bunch of Mac iPhone users. No case. Or, no, you have a bumper case. No case. You have a bumper case. Allison has a bumper case. Uh, no, Is that a case? No case. No case. No. So maybe I'm wrong. Maybe because it is a beautiful phone, right? You don't want to put it in a case. Too bad that it's made of glass. But that's just the way life is sometimes. Beautiful things break. The... Um, the new iPhone has a metal back, so it's probably a little less prone to uh, shattering. Kenny uh, says uh, in San Francisco, Steve Jobs never said you're holding it wrong. He said, don't hold it that way. Yeah, that's how, that's how uh, folklore is, isn't it? Don't hold it that way. <laughs> Same idea. <laughs> uh, the purple lens flare, just point it somewhere else. <laughs> 8888 Ask Leo. Um, we've talked about the iPhone 5 for the last couple of weeks. Uh, nice phone. Nicely done. Beautiful iPhone. Well made. It really feels like kind of a... And I guess this is why you don't want to put it in a case. By the way, I don't have a case. But no, you know, the cases really aren't... There aren't many to choose from yet. But it's, 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 it's well made, and it's a beautiful kind of a work of art. It's probably not state-of-the-art anymore. There are better cameras out there. There's 
you know, I think you could argue that Android might have uh, some more functionality. You could, you could say that, uh, you know, the screen size just is still a little bit small in this age of five inch and six inch screens, but it's still a beautiful phone. If you like, and if you like iOS devices or you you kind of have a lot of apps and that kind of thing, or there's no reason not to get an iPhone five, especially if you're due for an upgrade. It's a nice upgrade. And what's good for everybody, the good news for everybody is there's so many good choices out there now. I, uh, I, I have actually, I was carrying the iPhone 5 exclusively for a while, and I just couldn't do it. <laughs> I, just, I, I now carry both the iPhone 5 and my Galaxy S3, which does have a highly unattractive case on it, I might add. Um, I just, you know, I like a big screen because I'm a big guy with big fat fingers. 8888-ASK, Leo. Let's, uh, let's talk tech. Phones or anything you want. It's on your mind. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. To answer your question, Dr. Mom, forced to carry one. I'd probably carry the uh, Galaxy S3, but you know, I uh, there's a few things I miss. It is the I would miss on the iPhone. Today. And I one is just the ability to add to shopping lists in Siri. I've been doing that like as I walked into work today. Uh, I'm thinking of things I need to buy, and I'm adding them to Siri, and it's really kind of fast and easy to do that. And that's something that I don't I don't find as easy to do on uh, on the Galaxy. I have my, uh, I, it's reminders. You call it uh, reminders. And uh, and I found a bug, by the way. I, I accidentally, instead of naming it furniture, because I need to buy some furniture, I named it fern. And even though I renamed it three times to furniture, it, 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 it Siri kept saying, oh, you don't have anything called furniture. You have fern. Would you like to add it to the fern list? So finally, the fourth time I edited it, I exited out of the program, force quit, turned the phone off, Turn it on again. Now it stayed furniture. So there's a that's a bug I found in there. Um, I I find very few things the iPhone does better than anybody else. That might be one. Chris Marquardt, we'll talk about lens flare in our um, phone uh, camera segment uh, at twelve thirty. Good thinking, Chris. Lens flare: the good, the bad, and the ugly. You know, I can't really report on phone calls, Kenny and the Skull, because I never use it for a phone, <laughs> or rarely use it for a phone, so I don't have enough experience. Plus, you know, all of that has to do more with, uh, I think, with where you are, uh, how many bars you have, uh, you know, if AT&T is, or uh, Verizon's good in your area. I have a Verizon. I, I changed uh, to Verizon from AT&T on the iPhone. And then this is AT&T, the Galaxy S3. Uh, I used to have some problems with the sound on the Galaxy S3, but I, but I think it was my apartment because I lived in a Faraday cage, and I think that that was part of the problem. I couldn't get radio reception, and my atomic clock wouldn't work either. So, uh, yeah, so I should make more calls with the iPhone 5 and see. Now, on the other hand, I... Uh, I was on an automated call yesterday, a survey, you know, where you, they call you back after the delivery and they say, how, how did it, you know, on a scale of one to five. And I was going through it and it was working. And then I got the last question. I kept pressing five. I said, I don't know what the hell you're pressing, but that's not five. And I think that was just because it was a little garbled because, you know, I was inside. So I don't know. My atomic clock works in my new house. That's why I moved. Bobcat, I'm still planning on getting the Windows uh, 8X. From HTC. I don't want to. I don't want to spend the money. And I'm debating now whether to order, whether to wait for the Verizon Galaxy Note 2. No, I like Verizon. The reason I went to Verizon is in Petaluma, the only uh, phone company with LTE is Verizon. So that's why. And again, that's just completely local. It has nothing to do with your experience. Um, I can get now from Expansus. I can get the Galaxy Note 2. It's in stock. This is the Unlocked European. This is where I got the Galaxy S3. So I, I know this is a good company. But it's 529 Libby's. Convert to dollars. $855. Wow. That is, that is a lot of money. That is a lot of money. 
I don't think I really could justify $855 for that. And that's for the 16 gig. <sighs> and I'll have to put it on AT&T with HSPA. I won't be able to um, use LTE with it. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. A little mum- Mumford for a Sunday morning. 8888-ASK-LEO. Hey, let's just go to the phones. Chris, I do want to say Chris Marquardt, our, phone, our camera guy, is going to talk about lens flare. He's listening. And he said, hey, let's talk about lens flare uh, next hour. So uh, lens flare is something that happens to all cameras. We'll talk about what it is, what to do about it, when you want it, when you don't want it, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Lens flare next hour. So it's not just camera phones. All lenses get lens flare. And there's some some people like J.J. Abrams, the, the film director, love it. Remember uh, the new Star Trek? <laughs> it was... I felt like I was sitting in the sun for the whole movie. It was just lens flare. I'd be like, my eyes, my eyes are burning, burning, because it's just lens flare after light. He loves those lens flares. Let's go to the phones. JR in Detroit, the Motor City. Hello, JR. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hey there, Leo. Uh, I've been listening to you for several years now, and I enjoy your show. Thank I you. wanted to pass along a tip. Um, I have a set of speakers uh, that are about 20 years old. From Polk Audio. Good speakers. Polk Audio. Love them. Oh, yeah, they do sound awesome. Oh, They're yeah. And jazz. I think speakers 20 years ago were better. Maybe it's just me. I, my ears were better 20 years ago, but I think speakers 20 years ago were better. I don't know why. I just feel like they're not as good nowadays. Yeah, I um, will have to agree with you on that one. Um, anyway, um, I had a situation where the spider, uh, spider coil on uh, the woofer, uh, one of these that they're uh, passive radiator uh, type two-way design and the spider coil had come unglued and so the cone kind of like jumped out of the uh, uh, whatever you want to call it anyway I ended up taking some super glue and gluing that down but in the process of doing that uh, I had ripped the surround uh, oh, dear. The rubber surround oh dear so I super glued that back together <laughs> and once I got it back together I just sprayed, I took them both apart, both speakers, and sprayed them down with Armor All, inside and out, and they're like brand new again. Wow. That's a great yeah. tip. Super glue and Armor All. Now, you got to be careful because you don't want to get any glue on the cone, for instance, because that'll change the response. No. It, I was, I'm, I've been in audio all my life. I'm so you 50. know what you're doing, yeah. See, this is, that's, I think older speakers sound better, but... They also, uh, you know, the glue dries, the cones dry, things kind of wear. So, so yeah, armor all really. I'd never thought of that. Now, that w- that's not on a paper cone. That would be on a, a rubber cone. No, this this was paper and rubber. You know, so, um, you know, know, rubber surround. And uh, I just let them soak for several days with a uh, whole bunch of. The, I've used almost a half a, a half a bottle of this armor all stuff on there. Now, what and, is Armor All anyway? <laughs> what the, what the heck? Know you, I don't know if you can even buy it anymore. Oh, yeah, you can buy it. I know what it, I know what you'd use it for. You know, it kind of re- reconditions or brings back rubber. But uh, but I'm wondering what's in it. <laughs> it's white, right? It's like... Oh, you know, it I look, have no idea. <laughs> yeah. Let me, let me, you know, because it's probably... I would guess it's silicone or something like it. Well, I would imagine it's some kind of a petroleum... Uh, you know, whatever. Yeah. And silicone doesn't really matter. The speakers sound great. I, you know, I shot the the tweeter down, which is a dome tweeter, and uh, it's about it's a six inch uh, radius um, um, woofer and with a passive, you know, radiator. And um, but yeah, that they is, work. Great. That is a great tip. Now I will not be held responsible, ladies and gentlemen, if you do this to your speakers and they're. <laughs> <laughs> now, that's not my part. Not my fault. <laughs> You're holding it wrong. But Jr. says to do it. It's a good idea. You know, when you have an older uh, set of speakers, that's one of the things that does start to happen. But gosh, some of these well, classic speakers going out and spending five hundred bucks for this. Bet. And Polk Audio is fantastic stuff. You know, I think one of the things that happened is a lot of these companies got sold to bigger companies, and and lost yeah. you know the vision of the founder, uh, and and they just kind of became you know. Big well, if I could have it my way, I would own a set of clips horns. Me too. Oh. Me too. But then those would have the same problem, I would guess. They would dry out and the glue would loosen. and You'd have to condition them. 
I wonder if there's a business doing that. Well, uh, in the Detroit area, there's really not a lot happening. We had almost hi-fi here for all years, um, which was a real high-end audio shop. They, they went out of business uh, a couple of, two, three years ago. So there's really nowhere to go. You just got Best Buy, and, you know, most of the stuff in there is not all that good. Yeah. And, you know, though, I think it's interesting, and Scott Wilkinson, our home theater guy, I think, observed this. People are starting to buy S- stereos <laughs> they're starting to they're starting to want better audio you know neil young has been on a kick uh ne- you know neil young the singer of uh, formerly of crosby stills nash and young and of course a gr- you know great solo a canadian solo artist he's been saying for years <laughs> it's kind of like us crusty old guys jr you kids don't know good music he says everybody's listening to MP3s, which are highly compressed, on little earbuds, and it's just it's teaching us, uh, you know, to like poorly reproduced music. So he's created a, a new company and a new player that's coming out, and I will certainly review this. Now, the real problem, of course, is that Neil and I, and probably you too, Jr. I would guess, are getting a little old, and so our ears are not as good, especially at the high end. So we don't, we maybe can't distinguish, you know, really great sound from just average sound. I I know I can't anymore. I listen to too much rock and roll in my day, and I listen to headphones, you know, as a, as my work and so forth. But Neil Young has decided to create a 21st century sound format that's much higher quality even than CD. It's a digital format. Pono, P O N O is the name of the company. And you'll be able to download special recordings. I think it's 96... What is the sample rate? I think it's 96 kilohertz and a 24-bit sound. So it's a much higher sample rate than the 16... Than the 40, well, no, I see why it's... Uh, 44... CDs are recorded 44.1 uh, thousand cycles per second. 44.1 kilohertz... Uh, 16-bit resolution. So that means 44,100 times a second, the computer samples the sound and assigns it a number in the 16-bit range. That's about 65,000 possible numbers. And that's how it samples. Neil Young wants to do a digital format that's higher quality than CD, higher quality than most recordings are made. And I I can't remember. I'm going to have to look here to see what the sample rate is. I know it's 24-bit resolution. But, of course, you won't be able to play that back on your computer without special software or on an MP3 player. You can't play it back on an iPod. Uh, so he's creating a new player called the Pono, P-O-N-O, player that will play back this high-resolution audio. Uh, I guess it's uncompressed or it's, it's uh, you know, not, not compressed with what they call lossy, probably lossless compression. And Pono will have, he's already got, because he's Neil Young, he's already got three, the big three record companies to go along. So this I find very interesting. And I will certainly review it when it comes out, even though I won't be able to tell the difference. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. There's the Pono player. 192 kilohertz, 24-bit. The music will be mastered. So that's considerably more than 44116. Considerably more. That's a lot. Now, it's still not analog, but it's probably at the at that resolution. You're probably talking uh, indistinguishable from analog. Warner Music, Universal Music, and Sony Music are all interested in doing it. And Warner Music Group has a, has a bunch of uh, 192, 24 masters, so I guess they do record at that quality. The musical system will be called Studio Quality Sound, and the player will be the Pono, which doesn't look like it'll fit in your pocket very well. Maybe that. Sometime next year it'll launch. Can't wait to uh, to, to hear that. Hey, our show today brought to you by my friends at Ring Central. You know, when we moved into the uh, the Brick House studio, we had to get a new phone system. And we did. 
And it might look to you very much like uh, you know any old business phone system. There's my system. I got multiple lines, and you know I've got the Do Not Disturb on right now. And it's you know it's a nice. This is actually a, a Polycom unit. But when I plug it in, I'm not plugging it into the POTS service. I'm not plugging it into a PBX in the basement. I'm plugging it into Ring Central, the internet. It's cloud-based phone system with zero startup costs. I like that. I didn't want to spend thousands of dollars and put a PBX in the basement that nobody could figure out. Uh, tw- as, lo- as low as 20 bucks per user per month. That's what we pay. So, And when I add another uh, uh, employee... I just I get him a phone, I plug it into the wall, and ba dung ba ding gong It was Russell Tammany, our uh, our IT uh, consultant, who suggested Ring Central. I'm very glad he uh, suggested it. We have been very happy more than a year now, and it does things you can't do with a regular phone system. For instance, um, there's a Ring Central app for your iPhone and Android phone, so you can place calls from your cell phone, and it looks like it's coming from the business number. Your voicemail gets emailed to you. It's just it, faxes get emailed to you. It's just a lot of stuff like that. It's very handy. Our, our phone tree will ring my cell phone, for instance, if my if this office phone uh, doesn't go through. Call 800-543-9980 if you want to find out more or visit ringcentral.com and use the promo code TWIT for a 30-day risk-free trial. And just for my listeners, when you buy a desk phone, you'll get a second phone free up to 20 phones. So that is a way to get your office. I wish we'd had that offer. 800-543-9980. 800-543-9980 or visit ringcentral.com and use the promo code TWIT. It really is a great service. If you're setting up a new business or you're getting tired of paying through the nose for your old phone service, get something that's very modern, state-of-the-art, ringcentral.com. Use the offer code TWIT, T-W-I-T. I want a Pono. I did get those Aperian speakers, though. I'll give you a review of those. And I got a Denon amp to uh, to have an Onkyo now, and I wanted to try the Denon. I saw BYOD is coming. Isn't that exciting? So I may uh, move my uh, Galaxy S3. In fact, I will. I guarantee you I will move my Galaxy S3 over to, to Ting. They were going to send me a Galaxy S3, but I think I'll just use mine. Oh, actually, I can't, can I? Because it has to be a CDMA device, doesn't it? Because they're on, they're on Sprint. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> Little Neil Young for you there. Thank you, Kyle Benham, our musical director. He's always on the ball, always playing appropriate, apropos music for the show. And... He makes his playlist available after the fact on his Google Plus page, K-Y-L-E space B-E-N-H-A-M, and we'll also add it uh, to the show notes. Show notes are online at techguylabs.com. Not only uh, show notes for every show, we divide it up into question and answer, question and answer, question and answer, so you can find the question that you heard in the answer or the segment, you know, where we're talking about Pono and, and, and find that. And then after the YouTube video comes out, which usually takes, you know, maybe a day, We'll t- you'll be able to watch the YouTube video or listen to the question being answered, asked and answered, see the uh, the notes from the answer. And and I hope and I beg of you, if you have a better answer or a, or a clarification or an amendation or you just want to say, Leo's wrong, please, in the comments, do that. The, co- the whole idea of this, we wanted to set this new Tech Guy Labs up site so that you could comment, you could add so that people could go to it and, and really see a variety of ideas, suggestions, opinions about a, a problem. So if you have an opinion, for instance, on this, uh, this idea of uh, higher quality music that Neil Young's talking about. By the way, I, I found the, um, the, the quality that he's going to be doing is 190. The, so remember, a CD is 44,100 samples a second. He's going to have the sound quality, the samples, 192,000 samples a second. That's that's all, that's more than that's that's more than four times higher quality, right? And instead of trying to uh, fit every sound into one through 65,000, he's gonna it's gonna be 24 bit. So that gives you what two million choices, a lot of resolution, a lot of resolution. So that should be. Uh, the, the, the Pono player and the Pono format will be out uh, next year, according to Neil. 
I'm sorry, did I say two, two million? 16 million. Thank you for the correction, Curtis. In fact, Curtis, Curtis knows his math. With 24 bits, you'll have a choice of 16,777,216 different levels. That's how digitization works, you know. The issue is, how do we get sound, which is a waveform? So as I speak, I uh, my, my vocal cords, and the same thing with an instrument, are moving air, right? They're moving the air in uh, in sympathy with the vibrations of either my vocal cords or the guitar string or the piano string. And if you're in the same room, the air moves and it gets to you, and your eardrum then takes those vibrations in sympathy with the vibration of the string or the vocal cord and sends that to your brain. Your brain hears it. But if you want a computer to do it, the computer doesn't understand these waveforms. They look, they, you know, they actually you can, you can see them. They look like, you know, z little ziggy waveforms. Up and down, up and down, up and down, like the ocean. Uh, so the computer has to somehow get this into ones and zeros. So the way it does it, it's called sampling. And in fact, this is what all the process of all digita digitization is, is to take something from the real world <laughs> and turn it into ones and zeros so the computer can manipulate it, transmit it, copy it. It's got to be binary numbers. It's got to be numeric. So the way we do it with sound is we sample it. So the computer, 192,000 times a second, that's a lot looks at that waveform, sees where the wave is on the, if you imagine it on a, on a, on a, 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 a graph, on an XY axis, you sees where it is on the XY axis and assigns it a number. In this case, uh, a, a, a number that has, you know, very high resolution. 16 million possible levels. So it picks that number. And then it does it again and again and again, 192,000 times a second for Neil Young's format. For a CD, it's not quite so often. 44,100 times a second. And it chooses a 16-bit number instead. And then, and then it does it again and again and again. So what it's getting is a bunch of numbers. That's all. And it can reproduce the sound by applying those numbers, converting that digital sound to analog. That's what a digital-to-analog converter does. Your sound card is one. And it gets back to waves. And the key is we need to store it in such a way that we can get all that information from the wave or as much as possible. You're never going to have a perfect reproduction, are you? But the more information you collect from that wave, the better you'll be able to reproduce it. It's not a complete, it's not a smooth wave, but you get enough steps in a, in a curve. It can look like a curve. And your ear probably, at, I would guess at that resolution, can't tell the difference. I would guess, but I don't know. So we, uh, so this is really, this is what we have to do. We have to convert those waveforms from audio, the sound pressure coming through the air, to ones and zeros, store it, convert it, manipulate it, copy it, paste it, do all the things you can do with a computer. And then, when we're done, transmit it. it comes on your computer or your sound player, and then your sound player has a digital to analog converter, does the reverse of that process. It undoes it and turns it into air, pulsing air that goes into your ear. Earbuds do that, speakers do that, and, and then we got music. The better we do it, the the better it'll sound. The more, at least, I shouldn't say the better it will sound, but the more it will sound like the original. And that's the trick. That's what Neil Young wants to do. He says, we're not getting, and you know, he is a musician. He's there when the music is made. He hears it a, in analog form. And so I think, music, and by the way, Scott Wilkinson, our home theater guy, is also a musician. I think musicians have a different idea about what we're getting because they hear the original. They know what it's supposed to sound like. Matt in North Hollywood, you're next. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Matt. Leo, hi. Uh, uh, I'm developing an app for both Android and the iOS platform. And on the Android platform, I've uh, been fighting sort of with the, my developer. Is an exit button necessary? Never. Neither yeah. on neither on Android nor on iOS, no portable device needs an exit button, nor do most of them have exits in the menu. Mm. And there's a reason for that. The operating system on portable devices is designed to handle that. So you can stay in memory until it decides to release you. So every app, and your developer knows all about this, every app has routines in it that it's supposed to execute when the operating system says to it, hey, get out of here, you're done. <laughs> 
It's a little yeah. deceptive because if you look at on the uh, on iOS, if you look at, you know, you double tap the home button and you see the icons of recently launched apps, it looks like those are all running. They're in fact they're not. And the same thing in in Android when you press and hold the menu button and you get those thumbnails of all the different apps that you've run. That's no, none of the many of those are not in memory. Only the most recent ones may still be in memory. Most right. of those have all been exited. If my app is taking taking up CPU percentage, then what? And it's just in the then background. it's not properly coded. Uh -huh. In Android and iOS, both they have routines that the programmer is supposed to use that say, "Hey, I'm in the background now." Okay, good, fine. You're in the background. Uh, I'm in the background. I'm going to turn off all my use. Uh, y your app is supposed to do that automatically, and I'm sure it will if it's properly coded. I see. The app cleans up after itself, and it really needs to do that because most users do not expect nor will they use an exit button. I see. Hmm. They don't expect it at all. Oh, wow. No. In fact, I don't ever exit apps, uh, and I would say most phone users don't, and we trust that Android and iOS will take care of that for us, and in fact, they're supposed to. I see, and then I, I, I see Android is constantly upgrading to another uh, version, and right now there's, what, 1,100-odd $1, Android <laughs> devices? Am I well, ever going to... Yeah, I mean, Apple made a lot of hay for a long time saying Android is fragmented. They don't say that as much anymore because now they have this iPhone 5, which is completely... Is it 1136 by 640 screen? It's a completely different screen size. Suddenly, yeah. it's fragmented, too. You know, that's the nature of the phone business. It moves fast. Uh, your programmer should be able to handle this. If you have a good Android programmer, it's a pretty straightforward process. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. You do not, NG Card, need to program, need a, a task manager, and you should not use one. Ever since Gingerbread, uh, Android's been very clear, do not use a task manager. The task manager will use more battery and CPU sitting in the background looking for tasks than it uh, solves. So do not use a do not use a task manager on an, uh, on Android. Um, yeah, you shouldn't have to ever, but it's possible to miscode an app. But I think it's pretty well known how to do it now. And I think that's, even from your it's iPhone, intangible, isn't it? Or your it iPhone, is. you or your Android. Android. Yeah. I love There's even, a, a, some say, an emotional thing that is taken out in the, in the digitization. It has a color. Sure you yeah. Music has a color. Yeah. And yeah. It's, it's open. Yeah. It's open. Yeah. There's an openness yeah. and a spatiality that you lose as you, as you digitize. And I'm sure that's what Neil's talking about. The question is whether any digital process, because it's inherent that a digital process removes information. So um, is, uh, the question is, and this is what those analog bigots say, you know, you can never get. <laughs> no. Well, and I think that's the other side of it is that Neil's saying, well, we're training kids not to know. We're training kids to hear bad music and say that's what music sounds like. We're also over compressing. So there's no dynamic range. There's all sorts of stuff going on. Um, and he wants to. And I, I, I think I, I think he's right. But so you're an electronic musician or are you are you also an analog musician? Do you play analog music? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So piano or what? What piano? Yeah. Yeah. So anybody who's sat in the middle of an orchestra knows the difference. I was uh, I was at ILM uh, for uh, a friend of mine who's an arranger um, invited me up to the recording of um, a uh, video game for Sony. Yeah. <sighs> Oh my God! When you're sitting in the middle, and I was literally in the middle of that orchestra, and then, but now, and I went in then the control booth, and they have very good speakers. I mean, they're Rebel speakers, top state of, state of the art speakers in a state. I mean, it's a beautiful control room, but it is different. It's electronic, and to hear it in person, the especially things like the kettle drums. Oh man! Oh, it's beautiful. The brass, all of it. This was for. Um, Drake's Pat, what is it called? Um, Un Uncharted, Uncharted Two, and it which is, has a beautiful symphonic score, really. And Alan, the guy who does it, did it, Alan, is just amazing. 
and um, beautiful. Lots of, I mean, big brass section with a lot. Of, I mean, I don't know, maybe twenty horns of French horns and tubas and trumpets, and it was amazing. And then, I think so. It was beautiful. I'd never heard anything so gorgeous in my life. But what's funny is there a lot of it is just bumps and stabs. So they're like, bomb, <laughs> and then it stops. <laughs> it stops. I have a recording somewhere. I have to find it. Now, but before I do that, I better get the football game on. I have to know what happens. No, I want, well, the Niners, it's not, it starts an hour, I think, but I still feel I should not miss it. <laughs> Eagles, Steelers, Ravens, Chiefs. I want to see the Ravens game. Uh, and then, uh, so you're a Cal, Cal football fan? Ah. Oh, you do? How fun. That's great. Go to job. I used to work at KNBR, so I uh, hang out in the booth with the, with the boring manager, Rob. Rob. Okay, Leo, Carbonite, you do live read here. Thank you, sir. But his output stink. His code not functional or elegant. What do Code Monkey think? Code Monkey think maybe manager want to write goddamn login page himself. Mr. Jonathan Colton, ladies and gentlemen. And the one and only song ever written from the perspective of a computer programmer. And it's highly accurate. Code Monkey like Cheetos. Code Monkey like Tab and Mountain Dew. <laughs> Code Monkey not crazy, just proud. What a great song. I love that song. Leo Laporte, the uh, tech a guy. And uh, we're talking computers. We're talking some obscure stuff here, but it's kind of fun. High-quality audio reproduction. Programming for mobile devices. Wow. We're getting geeky. Ron, save us. Ron from Laguna Niguel, Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Leo. Hi. How are you, Ron? I have a question now. Uh, yes, sir. Test, since I uh, updated uh, Internet, I mean... Uh, Updated. I had the updates on um, Windows. Microsoft. Yeah, Windows. Windows. I have Windows, Windows Seven. I'm using every it. second Tuesday of the month. You know, like clockwork, yeah. Microsoft pushes out these fixes, and boy, you better apply them because it's also an announcement to the bad guys. Hey, we got a problem here. <laughs> now I can't. I can't get on my uh, website, so I have to do a lot more. Uh, answering questions to get on uh, my banking statements. Uh, and so it sounds like what happened, you have something called cookies. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, people often say, cookies bad. No, cookies good. Cookies are what's missing now. That's why you have to log in every time. Did you erase your cookies? At the end of, uh, it does it automatically. But I have that, it seems like it's doing it uh if you are automatically, you mean when you, every time you start Internet Explorer, you have it set to delete your cookies? Yeah, but even when I'm on all day, uh, I go on to another website and it just... Uh, well, it, that's the side effect. So you got a choice, Ron. You can either enter your password each time or you can let it save cookies. All right, so what, what do I do now? I get on uh, Internet Explorer. Uh, go to the Internet Options and uh, go to the, uh, I think it's a, it's probably the Privacy tab. And then? It might be in advance, but what you don't want to do is, I think people uh, people get the message, and I think wrongly so, that you're being followed around the Internet and that cookies are the culprit. Here's what cookies are. It, uh, it's uh, They were created in the very earliest days of web browsers. Netscape created them. Uh, the What a cookie is is a uh, client-side, persistent client-side state information. That's why they call them cookies. <laughs> Persistent means it's supposed to last between invocations of the browser, sessions, and so forth. Um, a session could mean uh, a variety of things, a visit to a page or a day or a week or a month. But the idea is what we'd like our cookies to do is uh, persist on your computer, not on the uh, website's hard drive, but on your hard drive, 
in between invocations of the browser or maybe for more than a day and so forth. The reason, and, and then what is used in those cookies? Well, things like a token that says, oh, Ron already logged in. This is Ron. It's, this is his computer. You don't have to do it again. That's how, that's how Facebook knows you're you, and you don't have to log in each time you go to Facebook or your bank. Now, banks often blow out cookies. In fact, they should each time require you to log in. You don't, you don't want the bank to just automatically log in. But Facebook, hey, it's okay if every time you visit Facebook it doesn't ask for a password. When they create a cookie, they will also create a, a time to live. How long is that cookie going to last? And usually a good, reliable, responsible site, Facebook's one of them, will expire at every month or so. To, to just to make sure this is, this is, you know, this really is Ron. Somebody didn't, t- you know, Ron didn't sell his computer to another guy who's logging in as him. And of course, if you sell your computer, you give your computer away, or you let anybody else use your computer, you should be deleting your cookies or clearing them out. That's why you might see a checkbox when you log in somewhere. Is this a private computer? Is this a public computer? If it's a public computer, you want to make sure it does not save that information, right? But if it's a private computer for convenience, cookies are about convenience, uh, it will remember you and say, hey, oh, welcome back, Ron. I, you don't need to log in. I know who you are. You might remember what page you were on last. Notice that sometimes Facebook knows where, you know, were you in the, new, you know, in the news feed or maybe you were uh, looking at your wall. Other sites do this, too. So that's what cookies are used for. Persistent client side, that's you, you're the client. State information. State is what state you were in when you left the website. It wants to preserve that. Now, people have all sorts of paranoid, and spyware's really kind of inculcated this, paranoid fantasies about what cookies can tell you. Cookies uh, are not dangerous. Some privacy advocates will say they are. I think you should leave cookies turned on. If you are paranoid, and I, you know, some people are more paranoid than others, I choose to be less paranoid, but if you are more paranoid and you're willing to trade convenience for security, because usually it's a one or the other, uh, you might choose to delete cookies every time. That will make you more secure, but less convenient. So you see, that's the trade-off, convenience versus security. A good idea is in the browser settings to turn off third-party cookies. This is the one area where cookies could perhaps be a privacy invasion, not a security issue, a privacy invasion. And it comes from the fact that when you visit a website, let's say uh, you're visiting Facebook, there may be ads on that website that come from other sources, not Facebook. That's a third party, right? Let's say uh, let's say Starbucks has put an ad on your Facebook page. And Starbucks is setting a cookie saying, hey, yeah, he was on Facebook at this time at this day. Then you go to another page. Let's say you go to Google Plus and Starbucks has an ad there too. Starbucks is a third party. They know now that you've been to Facebook and Google Plus. Facebook doesn't know you're going to Google Plus. Google Plus doesn't know you've been to Facebook. Facebook can't read Google's cookies and Google can't read Facebook's cookies, but Starbucks can read Starbucks cookies. So that's where third-party cookies can sometimes cause a problem, in theory, because a single source can perhaps see a variety of sites, and it's almost always an advertising page that can see a variety of sites you've been to. In my opinion, who cares? So now Starbucks knows you've been to Facebook and Google+. Plus. So what? (laughs) I don't know. I don't... And maybe the choice of the word, they call these tracking cookies. That's maybe what's scaring people because that's a scary thing. Like, I'm being tracked. Well, yeah, Starbucks now knows you went to Google Plus and Facebook. They're tracking you. So what? Anyway, I don't care about that, so I don't set that off. But but it's not going to harm your experience of the web. You're not going to have to re-log in all the time if you turn off third-party cookies. So on most browsers, the default is do not allow third-party cookies, and that's fine to turn that off. That won't impact whether you have to log in and get it or not. But if you, if you, if you are concerned, you know, having a problem because you have to log in a lot, it's probably because your cookies aren't being saved. Now, if you've turned on, turn off, you know, delete cookies on exit, that's why. If you haven't, then sometimes the operating system can make a mistake. Maybe it made those cookies, it locked those cookies so they can't be written, something like that. Then you can have a kind of more persistent problem, and it's just, it's just darn inconvenient. But be reassured, it's more secure. There's always a trade-off, security versus convenience. You get to choose. Mark Tustin, California, you're next. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. 
Hey, by the way, Magnus Spheres were my favorite speaker from somebody who could hear the whining of a tube TV from out. <laughs> You have very high uh, pitched tones in your ears, huh? What was it? Yeah, Mag used... Magnospheres? Yeah, Magnospheres. When I used to collect news for newspapers, people wouldn't answer the door, and I said, Look, I can hear the tube TV whine of your TV. You're watching TV. Just come to the door. And people would actually come to the door and say, Seriously, you could hear that? You were, you were a young man at the time. Do you still hear them? Oh, yeah. Mark, hang on. we got to take a break. Do you hear something right now? That whining in my ear tells me we got to take a break for local news. We'll be right back with your call. Leo LaPointe, the tech guy. The <laughs> Aussie <Yossi> heard it. <laughs> he's, he's got opposable ears. They go like this. Folks, have you heard about uh, it? Hey, look, I got my Ting phone. I'm doing the Ting thing. You know about Ting? We, uh, I love uh, the two cows, folks. Uh, they're out of, uh, I think they're out of Ontario, right? Canada. And their goal in life is to change, to disrupt businesses that aren't working. So the first thing they did, two cows, uh, Elliot Noss is their CEO. The first, uh, one of the first businesses they did was domain registration. You've heard us talk about Hover. And the idea is it's not being done right. It's not being done well. So we could we could change things. We could make it better. And that's why they created Hover. And now they want to do the same thing for cell phones. Let me find the uh, Ting Lower Third here so I can pull it up for you. We haven't done Ting on the uh, tech guy before. I'm just really thrilled to have him. So the idea is what's wrong with the cell phone business? All right, I'll show you here. Go to Ting.com. Actually, we got a website just for you. Techguy.ting.com. And uh, take a look. Oh, wow. When you do that, you just automatically uh, activate the Tech Guy offer code. You love the Tech Guy. How about you? So this is, <laughs> browse around from here, but this is cool. As soon as you do that, they set a cookie, by the way. Uh, and so the Tech Guy code is now activated. So when you buy, if you buy anything, it'll, it'll automatically uh, save you $50 on your first device. So what is Ting? Well, Take a look at the plans, and this will give you some idea. The idea is Ting is month-to-month, -month, no contract, no early termination fees, no bundling or ride-along services, no overage charges. So what you do, this is just kind of almost like a serving suggestion to give you an idea of what it's going to cost. <laughs> I just, I love this. Um, you, they have a savings calculator, but you can choose from extra small to... Small to medium, large, and you're going to choose minutes. Uh, Five hundred minutes. That's I don't do a lot of phone calling. How many text messages a, a month? Two thousand. Good. Mm, and how much data do you want? And by the way, you can go higher than this. And the and the point is, if you go higher, it's at the same flat rate. The rate is the rate doesn't like suddenly hockey stick. You choose how many phones you want. That's why it's great for a family or a business. Look at twenty phones. It's six bucks a phone per month. So I got two phones. I'm going to share all of this. And there you go. My plan would be 89 bucks a month for two phones with this. But here's the point. You use less, they rebate it. You use more, they charge you at the same rate. You know, it's three bucks per hundred messages, basically. Five bucks for a thousand. And they just charge you at the same rate. There's no, there's no penalty. There's no overage charge. You get credit on unused service. There are no add-on charges because at no extra charge, you get voicemail, SMS, MMS, Three-way calling, caller ID, tethering, hotspot, tethering, hotspot. No add-on charges. No mysterious line items on your bill. You, 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 you pay for what you use, no more, no less. They don't want any hidden charges, recovery fees, or other stuff like that. Unlimited devices on a single plan. Each device, six bucks a month, period. And they have a very powerful account control panel. That's fantastic. No hold customer support. That's one of the things Two Cows is famous for. 855-TING-FTW. That's the number. I love it. 855-TING for the win. Anytime between 8 and 8 Eastern. And a real person will pick up the phone. And they will not put you on hold. There's also great online support. Help.ting.com. They even have forums for Ting fans. Startup guides. They've done a great job. They want to reinvent the phone. 
So if you're looking for a new uh, cell phone provider, it uses the Sprint network, by the way. So if you've got Sprint, uh, you'll be in great shape. They've got a variety of phones. Bring your own devices coming. But if you want a Galaxy S3, you just get it. It's unlocked. It's your phone forever. You're paying month to month. You're not paying more than... They even have uh, data devices, by the way. Oh, they now have a Femto cells, too. That's cool. Love it. This is too good to be true, says Minty. Try it. In fact, if you search for Ting on a Twitter, hashtag Ting, you'll see a lot of very happy users. Techguy.ting.com. Techguy.ting.com and your first device, $50 off. Yeah, and if, you know, you're in an area where Sprint doesn't work well, I'm sorry, you're out of luck. But if Sprint works well where you are, you're going to love Ting, I promise. Ting to Ting. Uh, this is my Ting phone. I love it. This is a HTC. Ooh, system update. Are you taking off? Would you like a picture before you go? Come on back. Thank you, sir. You are tuned to Premier Channel 7. Leo Laporte, the tech guy, will begin at six minutes past the hour from Premier Radio Network. This is Premier Channel 7. Leo Laporte, the tech guy, will begin at six minutes past the hour from Premier Radio Networks. This is Premier Channel 7. Leo Laporte, the tech guy, will begin at six minutes past the hour from Premier Radio Networks. I will. Tune to Premier Channel 7. Leo Laporte, the tech guy, will begin at six minutes past the hour from Premier Radio Networks. Stick around, don't leave. As long as you can bear it. Oh, that's a long ride. Yeah, that's the make yourself to home in that chair while you can. <laughs> no, Ozzy. Ozzy does not command any... You are tuned to Premier right. Channel 7. Leo Laporte, anywhere. the tech guy, will, sit on will begin at six care. minutes past the hour. He, he, as soon as there's Premier food, Radio there is, he's going to sit with me for as long as there's still food to, to eat. Thank you, John. I appreciate it. <laughs> and do you do it for a radio station, or...? Freelance. That's awesome. I have to find out what they use these days because in the old days it was just this little portable rig. It wasn't much. Are you using Comrex or ISDN sometimes? Yeah. We're using ISDN. In fact, I've got. I want to get ISDN into my new house so that I can have a Zephyr there. Would really be convenient also for redundancy. Well, good day to you, my friend. Leo Laporte here. The tech guy and explainer in chief today. I tell you, I'm explaining how everything works. 8888 Ask Leo. That's the phone number we talk tech. We've been talking audio. Mark in Tustin is on the line. He has golden ears. That's what they call it. Those uh, the audio files who say they can hear things that others can't. Now, when you're young, I know the the flyback transformer. 
on a CRT made a very high-pitched whine, and I dimly remember being young enough to hear that. Yeah, well, I still have to run past, you know, the anti-critter high-pitched whining. Interesting. And there's you know, also so, uh, sonar uh, alarm systems, right? You'll hear. I used to hear those too. Yeah, I'm 46. I still, when I go to my friend's house who has it for his bat for his front yard to keep the animals out. You hear that? I have to plug my ears and run. Well, you know what the kids do? <laughs> the kids, there's a ringtone you can get that's that high pitched sound, and only kids can hear it. The teachers can't, because as you get older, you lose the ability to hear high frequency sounds you would yep. you would be a bad teacher but they'll do that for their um you know like message alerts because the teachers can't hear it and i you know i i thought it was bogus so i downloaded it and i put it on my phone and i played it and all the people under 30 in the building went oh and all the old people went what <laughs> it's no, really I'll, true put the ringtone in the show notes and i'll i'll, I'll look it up it's called I'll... the mosquito sound and uh, if you uh ticks just posted the uh, wikipedia entry for it in our chat room. If you look on Wikipedia for the mosquito or mosquito alarm, in France they call it, I don't know why, the Beethoven. <laughs> um, but it's an electronic device. Oh, this is oh, this is to deter loitering by young people. It's 17.4 kilohertz. So it, it's, it's, you know, in, you know, theoretically, uh, human hearing goes from 20 hertz, very low, to 20,000 hertz. 20 kilohertz. This is right at the end of that. Now, um, if you, on that article, there's a teen buzz ringtone. Some teens have found the once annoying sound can be used as a tool and turned into a mobile phone ringtone, preventing disciplinary actions that may be imposed by teachers if their phone should ring during class. It's called the mosquito ringtone is being sold uh, Commercially, I'll find a link and I'll put it in the show notes for you, Tess. Okay. Right. Anyhow, my quite had yeah, I had two questions. One is is um, is there a text expander for the PC? Jean McDonald was just here from Smile Software, and she, she's gonna she's gonna say no, but there is something like it. <laughs> text expander is the greatest thing on the Mac. You type a couple of characters. Then you hit uh, a key or you type an abbreviation, and it automatically expands it with boilerplate. So I don't have to type my address. I don't have to type uh, the paragraph that says, I'm sorry, I can't help you because I get too much email. Things like that. Automatically fills it in. So on, uh, on the um, – there actually have been a number of very good programs that predate Text Expander uh, on the Windows side. Uh, but I'm going to send you to a program, a website that's very handy called Alternative.to, and what this is is you can enter in a program name like Text Expander, and it will then tell you alternatives to it, which is so fantastic. It does it for Windows and for Mac. Alternative.to, and uh, but unfortunately, it looks like you have to choose. Oh, that's a shame. You have to choose your operating system. It's not cross operating system. Oh, that's too bad. Uh, let me see. Let me try to remember the name of some programs uh, on the Windows side that can be used for auto expanding. There was one I used that I I think was was it? Oh, it was free. It was open source. It was a little complicated because you had to edit a a, a text file that. Um, had all the expansions in it, which in some ways is a little bit easier. I'm a code monkey. I'm good. Oh, you'll like it then. Let's see. Um, alternative to text expander. Uh, but what we want to do is find it for Windows. Is there a way to do that on alternative to? Oh. What is the name of the... You know, I'm just going to... I, I can't remember it off the top of my head. Uh, it, it will come to me, or I'll do some Googling, and I'll have it before the end of this half hour. How about that, Mark? Okay, and then the other question is, for my iPad, I watch a lot of movies at two and a half times speed. Maybe my good hearing... Movies? Don't... Movies you watch that way? Yeah. Wow. Unless they're, unless they're the Bollywood movies I watch, because they talk too fast to begin <laughs> with. <laughs> so, I've heard of people doing that with audio. Right. No, 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 really. I just, like, I just watched John Carter at two and a half times speed. I just watched Hysteria, two and a half times speed, which was hysterical. Now, just, now you don't do it... Uh, you do it for fun, or you do it uh, because you don't have the time to watch the movie? And, and... I just, I, I don't notice the difference. You don't I mean, notice the difference. Wow. No, 
know. I, I just can process that fast. So it it you know unless they're Mark, like uh, Mark, do you come from another planet? <laughs> you must. Uh, I also have dyslexia. I found a new dyslexia font that helps me read faster. I, but yes, I am very uh, pe- uh, super I'm, hearing, super perception. I'm a little worried about you. You must be an android. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> if they came up with androids. Code Monkey wouldn't need girlfriend anymore. That's right. You're a code monkey. What? What? What do you do? You do it for a living? I used to. Um, I've, but right now I just I more work on the computers. But I do, will write code if need be. I'm getting into web development. It's really fun writing software. I think people think it's such a specialty that they, uh, or or you have to be a math whiz or something. It's a great hobby. Yeah, I mean I have a degree from UCI, but yeah. Do you have an idea for the uh, for a you know because VNC or VLC excuse me works really great on the Mac and on the PC, but when I looked it up for the Mac, it, oh, VLC just seems to be a viewer for you know getting stuff from. Doesn't the, uh, VLC on the Mac have exactly the same features uh, that it does on Windows? I thought it did. Yeah, but I want it for the iPad. Oh, for the My, oh, you didn't say iPad. Oh no no no. Home Apple, right. Now. Apple won't let you do that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, see, that's the iPad is not a is not an open platform, so um, I don't know of anything. But maybe we'll look and and see. You know, I do a show with Sarah Lane called iPad Today, and uh, you know, literally every week we look for new apps. I've never seen. I've seen a lot of second screen apps, and there are video players certainly out there, but I've never seen anything on the iPad that will play double speed. Hmm. Double speed, wow. For video, not for audio. Many podcasting apps will do that, of course. Audible will do that, Audible, but on the, and on the iPad, but for video. Hmm. Strength said, he said iPad. It was just too fast for you to hear it. <laughs> Mark, I'll look, and I will find you an alternative. There are really a lot of good ones, but there's one I particularly like that I just... I can't remember the name of on Windows for a text expander, and it's just a it's a great program because it not only will expand text, but it will uh, allow you to pre-program mouse gestures and all sorts of stuff. It's it's uh, it's something I kind of wish were available on the uh, on the Macintosh. I love text expander and use it religiously, but this is even even more even more auto hotkeys. Web one sixty six, you rock. That's it. I, I the chat room oh, is my brain. Uh, I've externalized my brain, and now they know more than I do. Autohotkey.com, fast scriptable desktop automation with hotkeys. Now, um, it, you know it does a lot of things, but in addition uh, to it, you can just expand abbreviations as you type them. For example, typing BTW will just go and become by the way. But that's just one of many things you can do. The only negative on this, and I, it may be a positive, is all of the functionality is built into a, a, conf, a text-based configuration file. Um, it'll, it'll create them automatically. This is such a cool program. And it's open source and it's free. Windows only. Autohotkey.com. I install it on every Windows machine. It just shows you how long it's been since I set up a Windows machine. <laughs> Thank you so much, chat room. You're brilliant. And it's alternative2.net. Thank you. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. In Word, BTW is by the way. That's it. That just shows you. So if you're a assistant man or you're in IT, you know the classic here. juggling act. How do you keep your company assistant? Yeah, the phone company doesn't want to give it to you because they don't want to maintain a switch, right? Yeah, well, and this is ISDN. I'm using ISDN right now. Um, okay, good. Well, I'm hoping I can get it here um, in my house because then it's awesome. Well, it was my first high-speed internet was ISDN. Yeah, so-called. <laughs> oh, did you? It was my experience that there is a there is like the ISDN guy, right? There's one guy. The last guy. <laughs> and he's in a desk in the basement. <laughs> and you just got to get the... Because the sales reps go, ISD who? You got to get to the ISDN guy. That's it. That's exactly it. I got to find that guy for San Francisco area. 
That's exactly it. Right. It's a it's a, just another switch, right? Like the card. All right. But I can see they don't want to buy them. How many how many uh, customers can a card handle? More than one, though, right? See, with any luck, I have the only two ISDN lines in Petaluma, and they got a card, so they got an a open hole. I'm hoping that's my. Right. It was my first broadband. I had a kind of had to get like a CSU DSU to interface to it. I mean, it was complicated. Oh, yeah. And it's, by the way, it's a great phone line, too, because it's digital. You can use it as a phone line. I had a guy, he, I think he was a radio engineer, who was my ISTN guy. Boy, what was his name? He, his license plate said ISTN for you. What was his name? Because uh, he was the guy who got me set up, but this was, this was before cable internet. This was probably in the 80s. Maybe, no, it was Petaluma, so it was in the early 90s. Yeah. Because we moved here in 94, I think. 94, 95. Do you? Yeah, yeah. Well, the late, great John Paoli was the guy who uh, helped me. You remember John? What a great guy. I love John. I miss him. I, I was so shocked when he went because he was young. <laughs> young is younger than you. <laughs> Wow, Fortran? No, I basic. basic. Oh, fun. Oh, fun. That's so great. Oh, wow. Oh, you you really do go back to the beginning. Beginning of personal computing. That's awesome. It's a 17.4 kilohertz whistle. <laughs> it's a mosquito whistle. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Auto Hotkey. What a great program, man. I'm glad you found that chat room. You want to join us in the chat room and be my brain or help me? I'd love to have you. All you got to do is uh, visit the website, techguylabs.com. Techguylabs.com. Links there to the chat room. There's a phone number there. And, of course, show notes for every uh, every single show that we've done. This is episode 916. Wow. I think if you go back too far, you have to go to the archives, which you're not in good shape. We're working on it. 88, 88 Ask Leo is the number coming up in uh, just a few minutes at 33 after the hour. Chris Marquardt, our photo guy, he's going to talk about lens flare. What's the deal with lens flare? He's uh, All cameras have it. We'll talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly with lens flare. But first, Joe in El Cerrito, California. Hi, Joe. Hello, Joe. Hello. Hey. Hi, well, Leo. How welcome, are you? Welcome to the show. I'm great. Hey, I got a pretty straightforward question, a two-part question here. I'm a dad with a nine-year-old and a four-year-old, and I've in the past been a PC guy, but I want to get a computer for the whole family, um, for mainly me and the kids. And I, this is what I want to do. I want to do some modest video editing of home movies and creative projects that I do with my kids, photo editing, you know, go on the internet and have the kids uh, watch movies and do their some research projects and play some music. And I bought a, uh, a MacBook last year. I like it a lot. It's my first Apple product. And I was looking at the iMacs and, and they're really impressive and beautiful. And 
The question is, do I go that route or go for an all-in-one PC? Um, and, and it seems like the all-in-one PCs or desktops, they're obviously cheaper, but then when you start thinking about programs you got to buy and right. things like that, right. um, it, they get close in price. And, and, and the second part of that question is, if, if an iMac is the way to go, I've been reading a lot of you know online rumors lately that they're gonna Apple's gonna announce the new iMac anytime. Is it stupid to buy the current configuration? Um, and and not having experience with Apple, I don't know. Do, do the new products tend to be more expensive than what exists right now? And so I'm just sort of stuck, not knowing what to do here. You know, um, it's funny people ask that question about Apple because of course with PCs there's always a new one coming out, and in fact. Windows 8 comes out October 26th, and all of the PCs will be updated. But you didn't ask me that, did you? No. <laughs> people don't. No, it, 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 no it's people not don't something care. I care. Yeah, they don't care on Windows, but on Mac, boy, they don't want to get the old Mac. I don't know why. So, um, well, if it's if the new one's the same price, I just don't know how. It's they always do these. the same price. They, what they what Apple does, they put more features in at the same price. They don't change the price. They don't change the price. So if I buy the current one today and tomorrow they come out with the new one, then, I, then I'm sort of a sucker. No, I, because Apple will give you a 30-day turnaround. They will. Yeah. Okay. They give you a uh, – so you can trade it in. You can actually bring it back in 15 days and say, I want my money back. And, and you have 30 days. If they come out with a new product within 30 days – and by the way, if there is a new iMac this year, it will absolutely be before November 7th, 30 days from now. So people can buy it for Christmas. Right. And... There's no way they'd wait longer than that. There may be a new iMac. There may not be. It's un, uh, You know, Apple doesn't say there are reasons they might want to do one. Intel has a new chipset called Sandy Bridge. Apple has not yet updated the iMacs with Sandy Bridge. They've done it with their laptops, but not their iMacs. I don't really... To be honest, I, like I think the current one is fine. It's fine for what I, I want. Absolutely. It. And you make yeah. an interesting point. You know, the comparable uh, Windows machine, and I like it a lot, is the Dell XPS 1. And price-wise, it's not a huge uh, savings, but it has a lot more features. It has an HDMI port. It has cable in it, so it has a tuner in it. You can put the cable directly into Right, it. yeah, the TV tuner, which the yeah. iMac I guess, does not. So it's yeah. not so much that it's cheaper, it does more. It has more going on with it. I see. I, I see. love the Dell XPS 1. It's a Windows 7 machine. I'm sure they'll do a Windows 8 version. But I think it's a great computer, very comparable to an iMac. And the only thing is, you know, I getting into buying a video editing software, which obviously... Well, you, then you'd have to spend 80 bucks for Adobe Premiere Elements. Yeah, which so, isn't a lot. It's not a lot. Now, the Mac comes with and is more integrated into it, iMovie, which hasn't been updated, by the way, in about three years. Right. Um, uh, but iMovie's very good, and then if you step up, there's better and better programs, and they're f more affordable on the Mac side than they are on the Windows side. And if I use Picasa, obviously, it doesn't matter which doesn't I matter, get. matter, although you use iPhoto probably instead. Apple Dude, but I hate the organization. I, see, I can't figure it out. It's been oh, a year. Right. Yeah, if you like Picasa, they have it on the Mac. I like Picasa. I agree with you on that. Yeah. All right. Well... I would say they're very comparable, and I wouldn't look too much at price because uh, it's it's um, it's hard to compare the two. If you really yeah. want an H, if you wanted to use it as a television, I would say probably better to get the Dell. Uh, but the high end Dell that has all those features is about the same as an iMac. Now, now the the look, the the, the resolution, and and the monitor very is going comparable. To... Dell Dell has good monitors. They're not. Apple, I would say, maybe marginally better, but they're getting the same panels. It's just whether they choose the high end panel or the low end. Yeah. So watching a movie on either one is looks be great. It. I look. I was very impressed. I I thought the Dell XPS one was an excellent machine. I no, now personally, I think the Apple operating system is it, better for kids. It's less likely they can get into trouble. Uh, you know, it's a little more secure. It has very good parental controls. Um, right. So I, I like the idea of a Mac. And the my rule of thumb was always Mac at home, uh, Windows in business. Uh, right, right. And or if you're a gamer, get Windows because there's far more gaming. Gamer. But and the and the the TV adapter, you can't add that to. The oh yeah, sure. I, Elgato makes a fantastic product called iTV, which is in many ways more compatible. Because the truth is, there's no cable card built into that Dell XPS One. So without that, you can only watch unencrypted cable. It's not very useful. I see. Or you could put an antenna, I guess, on it. Yeah. All right. All right, well, that answers my main questions. They're, they're very comparable. I think it's almost, at this point, a per, you know, just a, a, a personal choice. It's, it's an opinion. It's not 
There's no factual very difference. Understood. But I, I my personal choice, my, my kind of preference, is probably for an iMac for your kids. Yeah. Yeah, I like the IMAX a lot. I, uh, you know, my kids use IMAX. I have an IMAX sitting right in front of me. I just think they're great. Yeah, they're beautiful. I mean, yeah, no doubt. Well, and Dale just copied it, <laughs> right? I mean, the XPS one is beautiful in exactly the same way. It's a, <laughs> it's the same machine. So uh, you know, maybe if you, you know, it's funny. Uh, Dyson makes the you know these bagless vacuum cleaners with a special turbine, and they're very expensive. You can buy an, a functionally identical vacuum for half the price because they just copied Dyson. And right. s- part of me says, well, I should not buy these cheaper vacuums because it's just a copy. But then another part of me says, but why are you spending twice as much if you're not getting twice as much? Right. I mean, if it's legal for them to copy it. Well, it's they... not. But Dyson, you know, it's very hard for Dyson to enforce the patents. Yeah. It's not. They're actually ripping them off. And Dyson, when you get a Dyson, I did buy a Dyson vacuum. When you get a Dyson vacuum, they have a whole pamphlet in there about how they're being ripped off. <laughs> they, they hate it. They hate it. So I have a Dyson, and my new vacuum, it's an LG. Complete ripoff. I'll give you the comparison. I think Mac and the Dell XPS 1 are exactly the same issue. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. I talk about everything. I like the Dyson stick, but I don't know if it's that much better. I think any bagless vacuum with a turbine whirl wind thing is going to be the same. That's my opinion. And I'm sticking with it. Hey, we're brought to you today by Gazelle. Are you ready to get it? I, you know, I wish Gazelle took vacuums. I would absolutely give them my, <laughs> my Dyson. Uh, but are you ready for a new phone, maybe? Huh? G-A-Z-E-L-L-E dot com. That's Gazelle. Gazelle is the place to kind of get new stuff by selling your old stuff. And boy, do they have a great selection. And do they give you good prices? Let's say you have an iPhone 4S. And you're still in contract. You know, I don't know. It's gonna, I, I really want the new one. And maybe you're, as I was, on AT&T. And you really want to get a Verizon. So let's get an offer. It's 265 bucks in good condition, flawless condition. It's even a little more, 275 Throw it in the box. Anything worth more than a buck, Gazelle pays the postage. But don't just do one thing. Get rid of everything. If it's an iPad, an iPod, a MacBook, or a Mac a Mini, a Mac Pro. And, oh, my Mac Pro. Wow. Hey, maybe it's time to get rid of my Mac Pro. Uh, get one of them new iMacs. I got this. Is it? Well, let's see what my what it's worth here. It's in good condition. Uh, hundred percent functional. It's got oh, you got to go through. Let's see. It's got actually two terabyte hard drives. It's got eight gigs of RAM. It's got a super drive. I got the power cord, the keyboard, and the mouse. Now, how much would you pay? I've never noticed. If I, I'll take it <laughs> for for a four year old computer. Five hundred thirteen bucks. Now, you throw it all in a box. They paid the postage on that, too. BlackBerry phones, HTC, LG, Motorola, Nokia, or Samsung. Nokia or Samsung. iPads, iPhones. Don't let it just gather dust in a drawer. Get rid of it. Get some cash. Oh, and let me give you a pro tip, okay? They'll send you a check. They'll give you a PayPal credit. But you could also get an Amazon gift card. And if you do that, they bump the price 5%. I think they're just rebating their Amazon uh, affiliate fee. So it's an extra 5%. If you spend a lot on Amazon, that's a, you know as good as cash, plus 5%. G-A-Z-E-L-L-E. I know you're hank- hankering for the new stuff. You're honkering for the new stuff. You want that new iPhone 5. This is how you get it. Once you get your new iPhone, you can get a quote for 30 days. You don't even have to send it first. Once you get your new iPhone, you just ship your old one to Gazelle. They very quickly turn it around. And their data experts will will take all your data off, too. They'll refresh it. G-A-Z-E-L-L-E dot com. I'm a lover of Gazella. I figured out how with Gazelle, I can trade in my Galaxy S3, my old Galaxy Note, and my Galaxy S2 and pay for that unlocked Galaxy Note 2. So maybe I should do that. 
Maybe I should, I really want the note too. Oh, let's get Mark. Could you get Mark Ward on for me? He's on. Oh my God, he's there. Hear me. Hey. I gotta go to the little boys' room. The theme song! I can hear the theme song! Go to Chrome! Hey Chris, do you want to do the uh, DSL Extreme billboard as well? <laughs> no, thanks. <laughs> Let Leo do that. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. I think this is going to be your new theme song, Chris Marquardt. Kodachrome, they play all those bras. I love yeah, it. They don't. They, they don't make you. You can mention that without any advertising. Because they don't. They no they longer don't, make it. Uh, they they stopped doing this like last year sometime. Oh. They do make. Uh, well, Kodak doesn't make any film anymore, but you could still get Ilford or Fuji Film. There are still some. Oh yeah, there's lots of film, out film. There. We talked about this a few weeks ago. Yeah, sure. But half half of my photography is still film. Wow. Or again film. Let's put it this way. Again film. I rediscovered Back it. Back to film. What uh, what film do you use? What do you like? Oh, lots of them. But uh, from on the black and white side, it's a Kodak film. It's the Tri-X, which is What do you awesome buy? Old of, stock? No, no. It's still available. You can still go to the shop and buy new Kodak film. They oh, still make it. So they make they make tracks, but it's not Kodachrome. Uh, Kodachrome, they don't do anymore. There's some, uh, I think they're, they're slide films. They don't make those anymore. Ektachrome but, is gone. But you know, I love Trix. They make Plus X? Ooh, not anymore. I don't oh. think so. Trix was the ASA 400, so it was fast, black and white. It had nice grain. It was just a beautiful uh, film. I always liked Trix film. Yep, it's still there. You can wow. still buy it. Always strikingly honest. That's the <laughs> that's the uh, that's the uh, slogan for Trix. Wow, huh? Yeah, but let, let, let's not turn this into a Kodak. <laughs> no, all right, all right. Even, even though they can actually use it, you know. <laughs> I'm amazed they still make it. That's just that blows me away. So, uh, but no, we wanted to talk about lens flare because this is the big story, yep. and I started the show with it. Apple <laughs> has to fight against the PR again, the PR hit, oh, because apparently right. the iPhone 5, if you take a picture with a bright light just out of frame or maybe just in barely in frame, you'll get purple lens flare. And all you have to do is Google purple lens flare, and you'll see hundreds of posts about this as if, True. as if, how dare, how dare Apple have purple lens flare? In fact, you'll find a lot of images with purple lens flare as well. So what's the story, Chris Marquardt? Well, let's first look at what lens flare is, because lens flare happens because of the, the properties of glass. Now, lenses are made from glass, and multiple lens elements, multiple glass elements are in a lens, and light that passes through will also be reflected by the glass. So there is some bounce back against other layers of glass. And uh, big, bigger lenses on DSLRs have, I don't know, four, six, eight, 18 different layers of glass. So there's lots of surface that light can bounce off of and, and then ends, ends up being flare. This happens in pretty much every lens. It's not, it's not necessarily the camera. It's more the lens that does that. And it's something that is pretty normal. Most lenses do that. There are just a few lenses out there that are that are almost immune to it, but... The, those, you don't want to get go, rid of it. In a lot of cases, it's used artistically, intentionally. Well, you you said it earlier. J.J. Abrams is, is one of the pristine examples of that. Uh, he uses lens flare in his in his movies All just to add atmosphere. Yeah. And and you know how he does it? Right outside the frame, he has people standing there with big big flashlights, <laughs> shining them right into the lens of the camera. <laughs> you don't see the people, you don't see the lens, but you get the flare. Wow. And that really adds atmosphere. So wow. I'm actually a real fan of lens flare. I like lens flare. And it's 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 something that you live with. So on the, on the one hand, what Apple says is that, yeah, point your camera slightly different. is probably a good piece of advice if you don't want it. 
Or button. use a hood or, or block it with or your use hand. A hood, use your hand. Use your I've hand and that. put it above the camera. Now, why is it purple? Uh, I mean, that's, I think, the re I mean, look at iPhones have had lens flares since the day they, they came out. But yes. it, the thing is, I guess, that it's purple. Well, the, the purple thing is if you have a pair of anti-reflective coated glasses, yeah. you uh, look at them, uh, shine some light on them and look at what that reflection looks like. It might have a greenish tint. It might have a purplish tint. That's uh, what happens with anti-reflective coatings. They uh, just add this uh, this a bit of a tint to it. So those lenses inside, in those pieces of glass inside the lens are actually anti-reflective coated. So there's coating on them to, to reduce that amount of bounce. And this will, in some cases, just add a bit of um, color to it. Yeah. All right. Uh, is lens flare good? Can can a lens flare be good? Oh, absolutely. I mean, as I said, J.J. Uh, Abrams uses it for yeah, great success. Yeah. <laughs> actually, actually, what I, I, I sent you an email with a link to some of uh, some pictures where lens flare is actually quite effective. Do you now? Will you use it? Will you go for it? Absolutely. Actually, actually, sometimes I pick a lens that is very prone to doing lens flare just because I want a picture with light in the background that adds. Lens flare, and if you look at some of those pictures, in, in pretty much all of them, the the flare does add atmosphere. It yeah. helps the picture. It adds a bit of mystery. It adds a bit of a bit of realism to it, and it's 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 a normal thing. As a photographer, you know about these things. You know about the the flare, and you you either use it actively to enhance a picture, for example, to add sun streaks and these kind of things, or um, if you don't want the flare, you point the camera somewhere else and, and try to avoid very bright light sources right outside the frame. Oh, look. I was just look Now, I'm looking with my iPhone 5 at our studio lights because we, we shoot video, so we have fairly bright uh, studio lights. And <laughs> when I point it at the light, it flares, but it flares in, you know, in true color. It's only when the light is just at the edge... Yes. That it starts to turn, it just starts to turn purple. That's it. May also be, and this is what Apple's saying, reflecting a little bit against something inside. Uh, that is camera. also a possibility yeah. that something inside the camera might, where well, the light might just skim over something, uh, uh, something it, right outside of the lens. They have a uh, they a sapphire lens cover. Do you think that could be adding the mm -hmm. the lens flare? You think? I don't know. I I would expect that to be coated, uh, anti-reflective coated on the inside to right. avoid some of the bouncing back of light. But, it, but it, I haven't it opened one yet. It. But you know, I don't know why people complain about such a thing because I mean, all you have to do is turn it a little <laughs> bit and it goes <laughs> away. Because they want to complain about something. Yeah. Oh, and another <laughs> thing, it's got purple lens flare. I'm if mad you, as heck and I'm not going to take it anymore. <laughs> If you look at the actually filmmakers try to even shape lens flare. If you right. look at J.J. Abrams, uh, he uses what's called anamorphic lenses that that create lens flare that's not round but more like like yeah. streak shape. It goes shape, dot, dot, like dot, dot, dot 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 down almost, and, yeah. and it goes sideways. It it kind yeah. of adds this adds this interesting shape. So there's actually a real science behind generating beautiful lens flare. <laughs> J.J. Abrams, the king of lens flare. If you, and and if, if you want more lens flare on your iPhone pictures, you can actually add artificial lens flare. There's an app out there, I think <laughs> it's even called Lens Flare, where you can put lens flare in your pictures. There's it's a, not as beautiful as real lens flare, but it's, it's a fairly good simulation. That's a hoot. A lens flare app. Yep. Wow. Try it out. You'll Chris <laughs> Marquardt, he uh, he teaches photography. He's got workshops. You can find out more about that. And, of course, a great podcast called Tips from the Top Floor. Uh, all you have to do is go to his website. We have a link at our show notes, techguylabs.com. Or you can go directly to chrismarquardt.com. But a warning, he spells it with a lot of consonants. C-H-R-I-S-M-A-R. <laughs> okay, Mar. That's good. Q-U. Yeah, all right. A R. Here we go. Here's the weird one. D T. Marquardt. D -t. That's a tongue twister. <laughs> well, you, you don't speak the D or the T, whichever you choose. Yeah, Chris, it's always a pleasure. Thank you so much, and uh, we'll talk to you again real soon. Thanks for oh, having me. We should mention before we go, we have a an assignment in process. One of the things Chris does to encourage you to get out there and take pictures is we have a monthly assignment, not a competition even though we will pick three photographers and their images to uh, you know, talk about on the show. But it's not a competition. It's just a way to get you out there. Our uh, competition uh, this month, did I say competition? Our assignment 
this month is to come up with a word or an, uh, an image that illustrates the word face. We've got some great ones already. Just to upload it to the Tech Guy group on Flickr, and we'll talk about it in a couple of weeks. Leo Laporte, the Tech Guy. I love that one. Look at that. That's, those are, that's somebody's kids. It's so great. Big sister, little brother. I love that. That is a nice image. There's some we good some ones. Good, some good, some good stuff coming in. Yeah. Face was a good assignment because people are really Giant enjoying face taking face. pictures. <laughs> but, uh, wait, face is also everywhere. Look Faces at that. are everywhere. That's hysterical. That's a hoot. Face, dog face, playtime faces. Oh, I love that. All right, now that's a challenge to get a good picture of Ozzy's face. I haven't seen any clocks yet. Oh, sh- that's interesting. Uh, oh, sh- 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 uh, uh, sorry, clock <clears throat> face. Oh my God, <laughs> Marley has hair. Ah, oh, I love these. This is great. We're getting some. Now, now we sh- now we should find a good one with a face and lens flare. Oh, there's a wall, a face of a wall. Flare oh. face. Oh, there's a, a possum face. There's the face of the moon, the man in the moon. That is a face. That's good. I like it. Oh, I like that. That's great. Headshots. <laughs> Angry bird face. <laughs> These. Oh, I love that. That's great. The motion in the foreground. Yeah, that's from Critical looking. Mass. That's a... That is a wonderful shot. We've got some good photographers in our group. I really like that. Very, very high level of quality. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I credit you with that. They're all, I'm sure, Chris Markwart fans. Oh, totally. Absolutely. <laughs> I don't think so, but hey, we're, we're, near, we're nearing 10,000, so it's, it's you're bringing good to do this. Them. You're bringing them. It's awesome to do this. It's yeah, really yeah. It's really great to see everyone doing something, participating, learning by doing things. All right, sir. Have a good one. Cool. Talk All right. To talk to you again uh, next week, I guess. All See you, Chris. All right. See Bye. you. And don't forget to like. I just noticed I have a huge ding in my phone. <gasps> I I don't remember dropping it, but uh, you know this is what people complain about. That's a divot out of the aluminum. That is a di- you can't really see it, but there is a major divot right there. I mean, all my phones have a little bit of a ding, but that's a bad one. Oh, yeah, here too. It must have bounced on a sidewalk. Right out, right where they say it, on the on the beveling. Right there. Yeah, it must have bounced on a sidewalk. Oh, well. I don't remember, I don't remember it happening. It happens on uh, plastic, too. Although, you know, it's funny. My Galaxy S3 has some dings in them. But um, it's all in the metal. So maybe you're right. The plastic rebounds. Car- polycarbonate is pretty tough. But the, the Galaxy S3 has a little um, metal rim here. And that's where all the ding... There's a divot there, just like on the iPhone. And a divot there. In fact, these this must have ha- taken the similar fall because these are almost identical. <laughs> almost identical to the uh, divots and the dings on it. must be like it, it hits that edge and bounces and then... Wow. Uh, Apple can't revoke my phone. No one can revoke it, unfortunately. I have, uh, I'll have to, they'll have to pay Verizon 175 bucks or something. What is the ETF now in Verizon? It's huge. There's more than 200, isn't it? That's why now this is good because it's polycarbonate, so this will this will protect it from future dings. I'm waiting for my rock form for the iPhone 5. It's not out yet. Is the camera on the new iPad better than the camera a- than camera apps? The camera on the iPad is the old iPhone 4 camera. It's a 5 megapixel. Sorry. Sorry, Siri. Niners game starts in a few. You ready to take off? Or you want some more? No good. There's good food across the street. Street Leo Laporte, the tech guy. 8888 Ask Leo. That's the phone number. You want to talk high tech? I'd love to talk about it with you. Carrie in Mount Ho- No, wait a minute. Now, did I have somebody on hold for the uh, break? No, I don't think so, right? All right. Carrie in Mount Holly, New Jersey. You're next. Hi, Carrie. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. 
Wait a minute, I didn't press the right button here. Let me try again. There we go. Hi, Carrie. Hi, Leo. I've been listening to you, watching you since CDTV, you and Patrick Norton. Wow. And you actually autographed my old Wall Street Mac laptop in Cherry Hill, New Jersey, many years ago. Uh, with, it has your signature in silver on my Wall Street. And, and what did you do with that uh, old laptop? It's uh, under the bed, actually. It hasn't worked for several <laughs> years. I just... I can't throw it out. I can't throw out any Max. I just can't do that. We have a pretty good collection here at the uh, Brickhouse uh, Studios uh, of old <laughs> Mac gear. One of it's funny. One of our engineers, Alex Gumpel, is a Windows user. He doesn't even use an iPhone. He uses a Windows phone. But for some reason, he collects old Macs. So he <gasps> have Mac SEs. Mac, I mean, just every kind of Mac. Well, they're beautiful pieces of work. They uh, are. Morgan they are. Webb. Morgan, Morgan Webb. Webb. Yeah. Whatever happened to her? Well, she's on a very obscure cable channel called G4. Oh. Her well, show, the one... What, so we're talking old television networks. Tech TV, originally ZDTV, as you mentioned, uh, was uh, started in 1998 by Ziff Davis Publishing. They published PC Magazine, mm -hmm. a lot of other computer Watched magazines. Watched all the time. On I that. worked on it. I did two shows, The Screensavers and Call for Help, through 2004, for six years. Morgan started, I think she started as a researcher for The Screensavers, but she was so comely and so smart that we ended up putting her on the air. She eventually moved on to host a show called, uh, I think it was X-Play, with uh, Adam Sessler. And when the, so the channel was sold, Paul Allen, uh, Microsoft billionaire, Paul Allen decided he didn't have enough money to lose to continue to run the station. So he sold it to Comcast, which uh. merged it with its gaming channel, G4. For a while they called it G4 Tech TV, then they admitted the truth. They didn't really care about tech TV, so they called it uh -huh. G4. But the gaming show continued to this day. Uh, Adam Sessler's moved on, but I th I believe Morgan Webb's still hosting it on G4. I may have to tune to that just to see her because uh, I'm not big into G4, but I'll watch it. Well, you know what's funny? G4 has is basically a failed channel. They 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 turned as often happens with tech channels to uh, reruns of old TV shows, mostly Cops and American Ninja, and because uh, they're cheap, right? And right. uh, they had a few shows still. Attack of the Show continued, and so did uh, um, uh, X Play. Yeah. But unfortunately, they have just recently announced that they uh, they're abandoning technology and they want to become a GQ for television, a men's channel. Oh boy! Oh, oh boy! Oh boy. <laughs> oh boy! So I'm sure Morgan will find more work. She's very smart, very talented, yeah, um, and very pretty. And very pretty, yeah. Okay. Uh, now, I have an iPad, the original iPad, which I love, still love to death. And unlike you, I don't like to update because when I update, certain things that I love go away. And Well, I'll uh, give you a good example. If you got the iOS 6 on your iPhone, all of a sudden Google Maps went away and you had a kind of junky iPhone replacement. Well, there's a big one. Uh, I stayed with iOS 3 for so long, but oh eventually boy. I had to move up. And yeah. I went to iOS 5. Yeah. And in the music app where I would used to be able to see videos in playlists. They separated would, it out into a separate app. And that separate app, no more list views, just tiles right. that you have to scroll and scroll and I know. scroll. I know. I hate that. It's horrendous. Is there any third-party app? I'll buy. I'll pay $100 for anything to give me back that functionality. Boy, that's an interesting question. I mean, there are other video viewing programs on iOS. Uh, right. In fact, I have quite a few. Um, is it is it videos that you have on your device that you want to play back? I have movies. I have videos. Okay. I have things I want to show people a quick two-second clip, and I could just scroll through that playlist and show it instead of them previewing and seeing a picture of that. Of that uh, yeah. Well, there's would... VLC. We were talking about it earlier. Uh, I think that, I don't know, can you still download that, or did Apple kill that, too? Or they might have. Well, I tried VLC, but it doesn't have the No list. playlists. No, it has tiles. And videos doesn't either. Um, golly. Golly, Sergeant Carter. I don't know what to say. I don't know if there is anything that'll still. A chat room, is there an iOS app? that uh, will let you do a playlist of videos instead of just tiles of your videos. Yeah, just text. Well, well, I, nobody has nobody has uh, said anything yet in the ch in the chat room, but um, we shall see. We shall Boy, see. I wish I could go back to iOS 3 just for that. <laughs> iPad was so great at presenting quick videos to people. People just don't often talk about this, but Apple does, in fact, when they upgrade, upgrade often downgrade 
yeah. certain things. Uh, and the biggest downgrade everybody's aware of now is maps, but it's not the first time they've done that. They've deprecated programs or eliminated uh, capabilities, uh, and you, you picked a good one. It really, it, it bugged the heck out of me when I suddenly my videos are no longer in the music <laughs> library. They're in their own. I couldn't for a long It took me about three months to figure out where they'd moved them. There you go. Yeah. I'm sorry I don't have a good answer for you, Carrie, but, you know, there's a lot of people listening. Maybe somebody has a good idea. All right. Bleeding edge, as you say, yep. makes you bleed. That's right. Okay. Thank you. All right. Lee. Nice to talk to you. I'll say hi to Morgan for you. Her husband, Rob Reed, is uh, is an interesting fella. He uh, he started Rhapsody, which is a music uh, uh, service predating you know Spotify and all the current music services, and wrote an interesting book about <laughs> copyright uh, and aliens. See, apparently, the aliens are superior to us in every way but one. They can't make good music. Their music is terrible, and they love our music. But but they're but well I guess they're pirates. <laughs> so uh, so apparently they have a fairly large bill, <laughs> billions of dollars they owe the music industry. His book is called Year Zero. It's a hoot. It's very funny. Rob Reed is the author. Morgan Webb's uh, husband. He says, "I am the luckiest man in the world being married to Morgan Webb." Larry, Orange, California. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Larry. Hi, Leo. What's up? So you got a new TV. Yeah, it's... Uh, it's got it, digital audio out, right? Yeah, well, the only audio out is uh, optical. It doesn't have what I'm used to seeing is the uh, RCA jacks. There are no... Now, see, we talked about this last week with our audio-visual guy, our, uh, our expert on home theater, Scott Wilkinson. And he said most TVs... We'll have an analog output. You're saying there's no analog audio out at all. Well, this is a brand spanking new uh, Panasonic, and it has uh, one audio out that I can see. Which uh, Panasonic did you get? Because I just bought one myself. Is it the... 5-inch plasma. I don't yeah, think... Yeah, the GT or the VT. Larry, let me, uh, uh, let, me, let me look and see. There probably is a digital to audio, analog audio converter. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hold on. A lot of these TVs no longer have headphone jacks. My new uh, TV is uh, coming soon. It's, Meetings uh, are essential. It's this. I didn't buy the VT, which is the top of the line. This is the GT because it was a thousand bucks less. But let's look at let's see if they have information on the back panel. That's what I want to know. What's on the back panel? They know a lot of them no longer have uh, headphone jacks. Most of the new TVs do not have headphone jacks. There it is, audio, audio output, uh, surround sound. So they gotta have analog because how do they drive their own speakers, right? Analog audio output for HDMI DVI. Oh, that's input. Where's audio input, audio output, digital? I only see one audio output. That's disappointing. There it is, but that's input. Yeah. Now, that's what Scott said, is there would be an RCA uh, component video out. Why in? Oh, because you're coming from some sort of component device. HDMI input, SD card, aud analog audio input, composite video input, and audio input for composite video, Bluetooth PC input. There's, it looks like the only out would either be HDMI, which has digital, or a optical. So this is the TV I've got, too. I'm going to have the same problem. But wait a minute. Wait a minute. Isn't... Okay, so... All right, so he's using, okay, his cable box, though, probably will have a way of doing it, right? Yeah, yeah Jammer B uh, went, to, went over to Lisa's house to hook up these speakers that I gave her, and they won't work because it needs analog out. Oh. Uh. 
Yeah, really clean sound. Padre says, <laughs> "There's. have you ever heard of digital speakers? They're only on or off. They sound weird, but the cl- sound is clean. <laughs> yeah, I got to get a DAC. Hmm. Dennis Ritchie died a long time ago, like a year ago. He died shortly after Steve Jobs did. In fact, I rem- the reason I remember that is people this were saying, why do you make such a big deal about Steve Jobs and you pay no attention to Dennis Ritchie dying? But we did. I love this one. Yeah, well, see, you convert the optical to uh, EI by coupling to a photo detector source through a 600-ohm resistance to a constant current source. Easy peasy, says Leland Slicker. Leo Laporte, the tech guy, will begin at six minutes past the hour. Oh, Rick! From Premier Radio Network. Yes, I completely forgot. Let's do it. I completely forgot, Rick. Yes. Dr. Webb, let's do it at uh, 1.30. You are tuned to Premier Channel 7. Leo Laporte, the tech guy, will begin at six minutes past the hour. From Premier ba, Radio ba, Network. Ba, 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 da, da. Dr. Webb wants to talk about field trip. Um, we will need your Skype handle there. This is Premier Channel 7. Leo Laporte, the tech guy, will begin at six minutes past the hour from Premier Radio Networks. No, no Twit Codes, Padre. DSL Extreme is a uh, radio sponsor. Six minutes past the hour from Premier Radio Networks. They'll probably source you, though. They'll say, did you hear? How did you hear about this? How did you find out? Well, a good day to you. Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. It's time to talk computers and the Internet. Cell phones and camcorders, home theater, MP3 players, all that jazz. Phone number is 8888-ASK-LEO. If you got a question, call me. I'll help you out. Got a comment? Love to hear it. Suggestion? Got that too. 888-827-5555. Three six toll free from anywhere. So Larry called. He's got a brand new TV. Nice Panasonic. You got a, you got the Panasonic plasma, Larry. Yeah. Nice TV. I just bought one myself. Uh, and I was looking on the website uh, for the specs. And you're absolutely. <laughs> of course you're right. You have it. But you're absolutely right. I was shocked. There is one audio output. Lots of uh, lots of analog inputs. But one well, audio output. And I guess the reasoning is that. Most people don't use the TV for their tuner. They're using some other device. Do you have it hooked up to a cable box? or? Well, <clears throat> right now while I'm assembling all this stuff, I've just got it on um, antenna because I live here in Death Ray Valley, Orange County. Uh, I get pretty good strong over-the-air signal. But anyway, we agree that we only have an optical output, and I could clearly see that that must be encoded digitally because right. it's... Yeah, I, well, it's a digital output. It's digital. So you need a digital to analog audio converter to run it in straight into your speakers. You have, right. You have powered speakers, right? Well, I have all kinds of amplifiers around here that I can I can just plug in audio in. But I, I had to get it from digital to audio. So I got on the web, and I found no end of the identical box. Yeah. It's about a two-inch by two-inch by one-inch adapter that basically has uh, the optical input and a coaxial input 
which looks like an equivalent, just a different kind of cable. Right. It uh, has a little, you know, power box on it, like I think five volts. So I know there's some kind of active logic in it. Uh, I hooked it up to the input to a amplifier, and it just didn't have. Uh, it, it, there was just nothing but noise. So I thought, hmm. <clears throat> I checked in the audio settings. Excuse me. <clears throat> I checked in the audio settings on the TV, and I turned off the um, 5.1 and made it to whatever they yeah, call it. Yeah, it needs to be just left-right. It needs to be stereo because it won't... It, the, problem, right. the problem is they're assuming that you're going to an audio-visual receiver. Right, that, and that's what the store... The store wants to sell you that at a minimum $250 receiver. I'm looking at this box that you're using. It's $22 at uh, mono price. It's just an inexpensive... DAC, digital yeah, to analog well, audio converter. Right, and but that same box is labeled 40 different brands, and you can get it on Amazon, like 16, I think, ah. if, if that, including shipping. Good. Um, however, I'm not sure how to test it, because I don't know if the box I received is actually functioning. Now, to make a long story short, I hooked it up um, with the optical cable, I looked at my amplifiers and I said, you know, maybe there's maybe this thing doesn't put out enough horsepower. Maybe I need a preamp. So I stuck a little preamp to their left, right R, uh, RCA. That makes sense, yeah. Right, and it it does drive the amplifiers and it does drive the speakers, but only when the input video source to the TV is from. If you laugh, I'm going to come and get you an old <laughs> VCR. Ah, the VCR works fine. Yeah, so the, the VCR is coming out, and it goes to the, um, uh, you know, audio and left-right channels using the adapter cable that Panasonic gave me. And they only have one input for that, by the way. You can't have two VCRs, or you can't have an old... Well, and, and, and what you're finding is why people buy AV receivers. Well, you don't have much choice, but... No, <laughs> and it simplifies <laughs> everything. If you have multiple inputs... Uh, you know, it's it's really the easiest way to do it. I presume you also have a DVD player. You might have a Blu-ray player. I mean, yes, both. Yeah, well, uh, you, you you know, I the obvious answer is a, is to spend more money. I know that's what the world wants me to do on pretty much everything from gasoline to food. <laughs> yeah. Welcome to the world, <laughs> and and I understand you're a do-it-yourselfer, and I understand your desire, and, I, and in theory, you should, this should be as. I think I think the issue is you you hit the nail on the head. You're getting some sort of encoded audio. You're not getting standard left-right stereo audio. You're getting something Dolby True sound or something. On the, on the uh, optical. On the little optical converter, this little box that you're looking at on there, it, it does have left and right RCA jacks. Right. But they, first off, whatever's coming out of there doesn't have enough horsepower to drive a power amplifier or even a small power amplifier. So I put the I put the preamp in there, but it only works when the audio source going into the TV is from the VCR. It does not work from off-air... Um, Oh, it also works if I if I have the old uh, what do you call it the DV, DVD player. It's not old. It's just yeah. Those are probably giving you just kind of unencoded standard left right, right, right. audio, and I think that's, that's right. the issue. So it's not the level because you're able to, to to put an amp on it and you're able to get it to a level where it works on the VCR and the DVD. It's yeah. just on this newer stuff, right? Well, whatever comes off the air, I guess HD one five or HD five point one. It's probably five point one, yeah. Now I I looked on the web. Everybody that's bought one of these boxes thinks they're the greatest thing since sliced bread. But I certainly don't see how. I mean, if you've heard that they do work, then this might just be a defective unit. It might and be yet, that. That by the way, when you get cheap. Chinese, you know, knockoffs. It might be. I'm looking at one that uh, the chat room suggested that comes from Newer Tech, and I like this company. It's 35 bucks, though. It's not 16 bucks. It's not the same exact box. It's a uh, toss link to RCA analog. But I think you're going to always have the same issue. It sounds like your device is working, but there's something not. You're getting Dolby, not you know, standard PCM, unencrypted, uncompressed audio. So I just think you need to look back at the source of the TV. Maybe the TV can't even do this. I don't know. 
I don't know. But I think that that's the issue, is that the source is still encoded, and you need standard left-right PCM uncompressed audio. And uh, this is exactly why people use AV receivers, because it just solves the problem. It does. It, the receiver looks at it and says, oh, oh, you're sending me 5.1 surround encoded in Dolby. I'll fix that. I have now two AV receivers because I don't want to go through this. Uh, the uh, Casey in New Hampshire says, turn the output of the optical to stereo. Should be in the menu. I think he did that, though. But uh, try again. Make sure that the TV is sending unencoded audio. That's pretty much everybody in the chat room saying. And I know, I know, Larry, that you said you did that, but try again, maybe. Linda Laguna Hills, California. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Linda. Hi, thank you. Um, recently, my computer doesn't always turn on properly. Well, it's a Dell, and it comes up where it wants the password, you know, but it, it won't let me enter it sometimes. Hmm. And then um, sometimes it will let me enter it. It'll get past that, and that word welcome will come up, and the little blue circle just goes it just forever. Sits there. Yeah, I think your hard drive uh, has had a little... A little uh, surus. It's got a little, maybe a little minor stroke. These things happen. Oh, Hard drives go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, okay. Do I just get a new computer? And no, no, no. Oh, gosh, no. Well, you don't. Is it a recent model? I mean, do you want to keep it? Do you Two like it? Years? Yeah, no, you should. Two years? So here's the deal on hard drives. I'll lose everything. No, I don't blame I just you. Needed, uh, and the, probably, the chances are everything's still on there. Seems to be. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Seems yeah. To be. So I'll talk to you. we got to take a break. I'll talk to you a little bit about what to do when a hard drive doesn't work in just a bit. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Because I'm not hearing Hey, you're you. busy. We're the, all uh, busy. Let's, see, uh, let's put the. And there are probably uh, lots of things you'd rather do right now than back up your computer files. <laughs> but you got to do this. So get this, Carbonite online huh? backup. Carbonite. Yeah, and this one doesn't seem to work, but you know, it feels very light. And that's probably because it has no batteries. Whenever you're connected to the internet with Carbonite, you'll never well, have That would explain why this has never yeah. worked. Ever. You got a couple of double A's uh, lying around, computer, <laughs> or your smartphone. Or I've been, I for, I think for a full year now, I've been trying, I've been trying, and I have carbonite. to get up. You saw me, I get up every time and turn that thing on. I laptop go out of here without carbonite on it. It's the better. Should have said, it feels a little light. Unlimited storage for your PC or Mac is fifty nine dollars a year. Took, and if you run a small business, Carbonite has plans that'll yeah. up all of your computers, servers, and external hard drives for a low, flat annual. <sighs> well, and I bought um, the Harmony One, which is a nice, Carbonite small, you know, uh, programmable card, remote. But Leo. it's you get two bonus too many of my things. Thank you, sir. Too, too many That's of my things are um, com. The offer code is toggles. Real. Time is money. Right? They're not they on switches and off they're switches. They're on off so switches, <laughs> and so. The Harmony yeah, One only works if everything's money. in a known state, right? You so you have to make sure everything's turned off, and then you can use it. But I if one thing is on, it turns that off. So I stopped using it. It's like it's too much trouble to, to figure to make sure everything's in the right known state, and now it'll work. Yay! From my computer and my printer, I don't need. All right, well, I want the menu. I want what I want to turn is. Oh, it's working. And it, this it, has yeah, never worked. Scale, so I always have exactly the right postage. I want to turn on closed captioning. It automatically captioning. fills in the forms for international mail. Gives me discounts. I can't even get it. <laughs> and then the, the mail. Yes. Uh, what was it? It was during uh, so iPad I today. Know, Lisa was using the remote on her Vizio in her office. But we have a Vizio also on the set. And it was driving Sarah crazy because it turned itself off. And uh, Lisa didn't know. I mean, she was doing. She was turning hers on. It turned ours off. And then uh, and then suddenly some off. Volume started coming out. It was driving her crazy. Um, all right, so how do I get this? I want closed caption. Maybe it doesn't have it. Yeah, usually there's a CC, huh? It doesn't seem to. Oops. Wow, this has never worked. Now I can do mute instead of turning it all the way down. Actually, it's the same. Um, 
yellow. Okay. Guide. I'm trying to turn cl- clear captioning on. I mean, closed captioning on. Does do we have that? Would Direct TV do it? And Direct TV does it. You are smart. CC. Oh, it's good to have an engineer in studio. <laughs> so that was uh, D- DirecTV subtitles, but I, that's not working. So let me try CC. Now, now it's not working. Oh, there it is. Okay. Uh, CC. So I don't want that one. Oh, it's, but it's the same content? It's just yellow, which I like better. Yeah, that doesn't. Maybe this is this is must be close cut. We're watching the Eagles. <laughs> now that is obscure. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Eighty-eight, eighty-eight. Ask Leo. Where did you find that? Kyle Benham, my musical director. That is the most obscure thing. A song uh, to this to the. Uh, Music of the Beatles, Let It Be, with words uh, about obscure programming languages. <laughs> Lisp is dead and boring, write in C, write in C. <laughs> that, where'd you find that, Kyle? That's wild. That is obscure. Oh, that was in honor of uh, Dennis Ritchie. All right, there you go. The uh, inventor of the C programming language who passed away uh, Earlier this year. 8888-ASK-LEO. That's the phone number. We were talking to Laguna Hills Linda. That's your new name, Linda. Linda in Laguna Hills. Yes. And uh, she says her computer is acting up. Sometimes it'll boot up. Sometimes it won't. Sometimes it just gets stuck. Does it boot up at all anymore? Uh, well, yes. Yes. Because once I push on the button and turn it off, uh, then it will come back on. You know, that's how it says it wasn't uh, turned off properly right because it, it wasn't because it, it didn't boot properly exactly. so you had to exactly. turn it off that's but fine then it works okay i left it on recently though because i'm i'm afraid to turn it off so i don't know yeah so my question is uh, is it the hard so and this i don't know and i know you don't know but there, there it could be the hard drive it could also be other components could be your power supply is starting to fail but since it's a brand new computer or relatively new it's only two years old I think it's most likely a flaky hard drive and this is not at all unusual um ibm did a study of hard drives a longitudinal study of hard i'm sorry google did a longitudinal study of hard drives over a long period of time as as you might expect google uses more hard drives than almost anybody because all of that stuff that you use google for is on hard drives yeah. And what they found was uh, they, they, they kept careful statistics on their hard drives that hard drives tend to fail either right away, like in the first three months, because they're just a defect, mm-hmm. or they work pretty reliably. But it, it's after two years, they start failing at the rate of 4 or 5% a year every year thereafter. Wow. Okay. <laughs> so you just got unlucky. You got a hard drive, I think, that's starting to act a little flaky. Now, it may, be an, it may not be the hard drive's uh, gone. It may just be that the data that was written on the hard drive, you know, got hard to read, and that's could be what's happening. Um, that that uh, Windows is looking at it, going, I can't read this, and gives up. You reboot it, it tries again, it goes, oh yeah, 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 I understand, and continues okay. on. Nice, all yeah. right. It could Should be that. It could be. I mean, there are other issues. Uh, there were problems right about that time with motherboards that had bad capacitors that were, you know having this kind of a problem it could be a what we call a cold solder where the computer doesn't run properly because when the solder is cold but as it warms up the connection the electrical connection is made but the fact that you're able to get all the way to the windows prompt and that's where is that always where it fails at the windows prompt no 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 not, not all the way it, it what do you mean all the way well it gets it gets to the point where it's already starting to boot windows right where does it get stuck in the beginning, the very beginning. What's the very beginning? What is it? Okay. What do you see on the screen? The blue screen, and it says Dell, and then underneath it, there's a little line for your password. Your password? Or maybe it's a, I don't know what it's called. Is it a, called the password? I'm not, I don't know. Uh, would you normally enter something at that point? 
You, so you password protected your PC? I don't know why. Don't ask me why. <laughs> okay, so I think that sounds like it's a BIOS password or maybe a hard drive password. And it's and, the, and it's getting stuck there. Yes. Right. Oh, okay, so we're not getting to Windows. Not yet. Now, no. sometimes you'll enter that password and it will continue on. Right, so where it, and then it says welcome, but it never gets past that. Never gets past welcome. So that's Windows running when you well, I think it is. It depends on Do you see yeah. do you see the line that says starting Windows? No. Yeah. I'm, this will be some this will be some this will be it's working fine now. So sometimes it stops and sometimes it goes it gets it can go all the way. Right. Yeah. I don't I am not very computer savvy. No, 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 don't 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 beat yourself up here. You're giving me good information. What I'm trying to figure out is is so from the from the point that it stops is kind of where we can tell what's going on. If it gets all the way to Windows and stops, like it starts to launch Windows, or it's asking you for your Windows password and then it can't go on, that that's more likely a hard drive error because the computer is able to get far enough along with the hardware that it can at least run start running Windows. But then maybe something in Windows is missing. But it sounds like you're not getting that far. Sounds no. like sounds like you're dying with it. What, does it still have the Dell logo on the screen? Well, that's where it freezes. It freezes on the Dell logo. Right. And won't let me enter that password that I... Yeah, you're, yeah so this wired. is not a hard drive error. I was wrong. I misunderstood what you were uh, telling me. But sometimes it does go past that, and it does get to the window. So it, it depends on what it feels like. It's yeah, no, you, you've got a hardware problem. Hardware? I would guess. Okay. Uh, but really what you got to do is get this to Dell and have them fix it. I yuck. All right. <laughs> I know yick is right. I understand. You're you're now faced facing hours of uh, limbo, waiting for so phone support and so forth. Um, but it you know it could be a number of different things that are probably not easily fixed. If it were the hard drive, I could run you through some stuff to try to fix it. But I think you've got unfortunately you've got to either get Dell or some local uh, guru to uh, take a look at it and probably do a hardware diagnostic. It sounds like the BIOS may have messed up or uh, you've got a bad power supply or a motherboard error, but it sounds like a hardware error. Well, I will figure it out then. Thank you. I am sorry. I I, uh, I wish I could be more supportive on this one, but uh, there's nothing I can do. If it were the hard drive, as I said, maybe, but hardware's, hardware, you got to take it. Either take it to Dell or take it to someone... Um, local who can who can mess with it a little bit could be ram could be so many different things that have gone wrong here and you're right it shouldn't happen after two years hard drive yeah that's not unusual but this this is more serious it sounds like gary in camarillo california hi gary leo laporte the tech guy hi leo i've got a couple of quick questions all right um, i was uh i need your personal opinion i was gonna get a new uh, cell phone and um, I was going to choose between the iPhone and the new Motorola Razr M. Uh, which one would you choose if you had to take one around the world with you? <laughs> <clears throat> ah, around the world. Well, Verizon's not great for around the world. Yeah. Because Verizon's CDMA. However, the iPhone 5 on Verizon happens to be the best <laughs> world phone ever made. Because Verizon, whether intentionally or not, did not lock the SIM card in here. So you can, in fact, take this phone and use it as a GSM phone or a CDMA phone. And you could even, when you get to France or England or Germany or wherever you're going, buy a local SIM card, give you a local number and, and often much less expensive local data, pop it in this phone and use it. So the Razer M, I like a lot. Great battery life and really beautiful edge-to-edge -edge screen. It's Android, of course, but it is not a good world phone. The iPhone 5 on, off on Verizon happens to be excellent. A year I've been struggling with that TV. Well, this is fine because I can just go to this right here. So, but that would be in the setting. I have no idea you can make this iPhone. Good for direct TV. Yeah? RF does. Right. Right. Oh, 
So use the IR blaster, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. This whole time, I have no idea. So, Chad, who's on Twit today? Thank you. Merritt, Belmont, and who? Jury. And did you get a hold of Corey uh, Doctorow? Is he going to do it next week? Perfect. Perfect. Look, I got closed captioning on my Vizio. That's through the DirecTV. Did you know that? Turn on direct TV. Yeah. And did you know this could be RF as well as uh, infrared? This man knows everything about the direct TV remote. So, um, <laughs> He's less. <laughs> what about it? Oh, yes. Now? Yes. Rick Albert, Call Rick Alber now. But we need a Skype handle, Rick. I got him. No, it's oh, you're all connected. Yeah, yeah. Hello. You hey, got me. I hear you. Yeah, I'm here. Hey. Hey. The miracle of Skype. It is a miracle. And I'm also on video, too, at least on my end. Yeah, we'll get that in a second. Hey, um, it's a little overmodulated. Can you um, cut your level or something? I'll move the, uh, move the mic the away. From from my yeah. Mac. yeah, that sounds better. That, that That's one uh, testing. One, two, three, four, good. five. That sounds good, yeah. Great. Nice show. I, Are you sending a- video? You're seeing video. Are you sending video? Press the press the blue sending video. Uh, let's see. Uh, I think I have to hit, hit the accept. Now do you see me? Not no, yet. not yet. No, no. We don't really need video. It is a radio show after all. Hello, oh, I'm here. Oh, here it comes. There it is. Magic. <laughs> Rick, you've gotten gray. Will you look at all that gray hair? You look almost as gray as me. <laughs> It's incredible, isn't it? Actually, my hair is aging much faster than I am. <laughs> I'm happy to say that. I'm sure Marina is still a redhead, however. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Permanently. It's great to see you. Nice to see you in, yeah. in this funny, technical way. you got to come up here sometime and visit our, uh, our the brick house. The brick house. Definitely. I want to. Uh, am, am I uh, looking okay? I'm yeah. trying to... So Looks I good. Got some notes here below the camera. But no, I don't, yeah, don't worry about that. It's re- like I said, it's just something. radio. I'll uh, squinch up my eyes, so you can't right. tell where I'm yeah. actually looking. Here we go. Doctor Webb is here. Rick Alber is uh, a longtime friend, and uh, for many years was on the radio show talking about websites. We don't talk about websites much anymore. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> we, did you do CD ROMs before we did? I think you did. Didn't we do CD ROMs for a while? You gave me the uh, the uh, name Doctor Rom a long time ago, and the then, and the, you got to pick a better medium, Rick. <laughs> <laughs> now he's going to be Doctor App. How about that? Can you be Doctor App? Yeah, Doctor App sounds good. So he was Doctor Rom, then CD Roms went away. Doctor Web, and you know who talks about websites anymore? I mean, it's not even a a thing. You, we've evolved. We've evolved beyond that. we we are definitely in the app world. And, and that's what I want to talk about today. A new uh, terrific Google app that's available for Android phones called Field Trip. You know, this thing is so interesting to me. Um, and they had an event. And I, that's one of the reasons I wanted to get Rick on the uh, line, because you went to the event for the introduction of Field Trip. Uh, it was you know, it's not exactly a Google. It was written by a Google engineer, but it's, it doesn't kind of bill itself as a Google app, or does it? Yeah, I think so. Oh, it does. They, they, okay. Uh, they're going to release it soon, they say, for iOS. So it's not strictly uh, ah. a Google uh, Android app. But right now it runs on Android. Uh, I think any version of Android newer than, than uh, or uh, including Gingerbread and newer. And uh, So what does it do? Well, what it is is it, it delivers location-based information in kind of multimedia format to you, to your device, your, your phone or your tablet as you move around. And it can deliver like history of local landmarks, uh, restaurant uh, listings and reviews, uh, local events and, and notices of, of things that are going to happen based on where you are at the time. 
And importantly, it delivers it in an unprompted way. It simply gives you an alert that can be an audio alert or a visual alert on your device. And then if you want to accept the alert, it will then deliver that information about uh, the uh, whatever it's notified you about. It is a strange experience. I turn it on and I turn on the voice. And what happens is as you're moving around, it'll start talking in a robotic voice. Over there is where the movie American Graffiti was shot in 1973. It is really strange. They have movie locations. Um, but I think that this is more than just a novelty. I think this is where Google wants to go, right? Yeah. And, and to me, the reason I got excited about it was it's, it's a new kind of platform for delivering information. And it's not limited to just, or right now it's limited to just, uh, I think they have 41 content partners that that uh, uh, have compiled information and deliver it to your device. But they want to uh, eventually have it be open so that third party mm. folks can publish their own content that's location specific and give users the ability to subscribe or to specify that they want information from whatever content uh, providers they're interested in to come on their phone. The, the fellow that I think has headed up the, the project team for Field Trip at Google is uh, John Hankey. And he was the guy that originally developed Keyhole, which right. Google purchased uh, in about a decade ago, I guess now, and turned into Google Earth. And if you, you, know, if you remember, Google Earth allows you to do mashups and create what are called KML files that are more or less overlays of your own content that plug into the Google Earth interface and allow people to, you know, see your content, your map locations um, within that publishing platform. So if Field Trip kind of can work the same way, and that's Hanky's uh, 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 intent, as he told me when I interviewed him this week, um, it can become a publishing platform for people that have information uh, specific to location and want to deliver it. Now, the, the uh, way it works right now is um, it's, it's essentially a database, right, that's uh, maintained on Google servers that associates uh, graphic, uh, you know, JPEG, an image, or a, a text file or both with a specific location. Um, they can also support audio files. So you're not limited to that robotic uh, text-to-speech. It could actually. You know, where I thought this would be kind of fun is if I go to Paris... If there's enough information, it would be almost like when you go to a museum and you and you have that thing hanging around your neck and you listen to the narration as you walk through. I'd love to have a live narration as I walk through Paris of historic uh, sites. Sure. And Matt, it, it's like a digital docent, right? Yeah. It's someone who's always with you, but you're not limited to a pre-recorded uh, pathway through, you know, a museum or a, or the streets of Paris. You can, you know, again, in, in theory, if this is if the content's there, you can set this up so that you walk through the streets of Paris and it would notify you when you came to a historic place or wanted more information. You could you could talk to it if, if it provides a voice interface. It doesn't do that yet, but you could presumably talk to it and say, um, I want lunch, you know, or I want, uh, you know, a place that's inexpensive and serves a certain type of food. And this would then, you know, look in its database, uh, calculate how close it was, give you some choices, much like kind of Google Earth or Google Maps does now, and then lead you to the um, to wherever you're to whatever you're interested in. This is Again, Google's holy grail. In fact, I remember Eric Schmidt talking, and it was kind of a weird thing he said. But we'll know if you need pants, and then as you're walking through town, when you go by a place with a special on pants, it'll tell you, "Hey, over to the left, you can get your pants." Right. This was right. his vision, and this is, I mean, that's kind of a trivial use, but this is an interesting idea. Now, of course, Google has Google Deals built into it, so it does, in fact, say, hey, you can get a dollar off a cup of coffee over there. Um, so that's where they're going to make money on this. That's right. And, and if you, you know, explain that example of the, the Google pants and the, <laughs> your phone interrupting you to say, hey, there's a pants store over here and there's a, there's a great deal on pants right now. I'm sure that about half your listeners are out there saying, I'm never going to turn this thing on. <laughs> I don't want this that. sounds awful. Uh, but 
uh, as I you know confirmed with John Hankey, they they put a lot of thought into the interface of Field Trip. I you know, like it. It's, it. it's beautiful. It's elegant. And I, as I said, I can't wait to go somewhere where there's actually something to see. Now, here in Petaluma, we have a lot of uh, movie locations. So there is a movie location database, and I'm seeing, uh, you know, it's kind of cool. Oh, over there, Peggy Sue Got Married was filmed. Or, oh, over there, the you know, uh, uh, American Graffiti was filmed. So that's, that's kind of neat. And I think if you went somewhere historic, it might be really uh, useful. I yeah, got to yeah. imagine that Apple wants to do the same thing. Most likely, yeah. Uh, with Field Trip right now, they've got different broad categories, so you can subscribe or you know turn on information about categories like uh, restaurants. It's and, quite a uh, few, yeah. And you do uncheck it, it. it if you don't want Google uh, offers. You can turn that off, so you do have granular control over what you're seeing. Very granular. That was yeah. the point uh, I was kind of getting to. That they they know that you don't want to be bothered you know right. a lot of the time so it's very easy in field trip to specify that you want uh, a lot of information uh, pushed to you or you want just a little bit or you want none and you can specify whether the thing will uh, translate the information uh, audioly so that uh, you know it it can interrupt you for instance if you want it to or otherwise it'll be silent and maybe just show you uh, an alert on your screen or you can even uh, specify that you only want it to talk to you when you're driving and, I and that not was when you're interesting. Around. Yeah, I thought that was really yeah. interesting. Yeah. So so it seems like they're kind of sensitive to this idea that people in some cases want information and in other cases they just don't want to have their phone nagging at them and uh, that that's a that's a very uh, important kind of uh, thought process thing. Rick Albert is Dr. App. We're going to rename you. <laughs> Thank you, Rick. Great to talk to you. The app is available on the Play Store in the U.S. It's called Field Trip. I should have asked you before, is there anything you want me to plug? You got oh, anything no, to I'm... plug? No? Just, no, just you? No, I'm fine. Just I, me. I, you know, yeah. I'm really glad cause I, uh, to, to talk to you about this because I thought this was really interesting. And I... You know when you you know, I, I think we need to contextualize it as really the future of mobile. This is where companies are really trying to capitalize on mobile and location. I, th I think there's an entertainment angle to it, too, that, that sort of gets me excited. That I love it. You, you could uh, have like amusing commentary as you yeah. go, as you yeah. say, you navigate, you know, in your car. Uh, you I could can't have wait could... till they have an API so that we can do that. Well, they've got a XML schema they've published for uh, adding content, but they still have to approve you. They have to uh, make you an official uh, partner before they'll publish your content. Right. But it's uh, it's coming. It's it's pretty cool. And, uh, for some reason, Petaluma is very well represented. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Mom, who's a listener in Long Island, says it's boring for her because it's just places to eat. So it really yeah. is dependent on where you are. It, Northern California is very well represented right now. I could have said more about that because I, I do know you know what their footprint is. And, and I asked uh, Hanky about uh, Jeff Jarvis's comment on Twig on Wednesday when he said that he didn't find anything in New York. And right. Hankey said, oh, he's got it configured wrong. There's like oh. 10,000, you know, New York things. Oh, okay. Said that there's, uh, you know, thousands of uh, entries between these uh, 40 or so partners they have now. Right. Here's uh, Star Trek VI, the undiscovered country, used the, uh, Marin, looks like the Marin Civic Center as a, uh, as a location for Camp Katomer, secret site of the peace conference. <laughs> it's really fun. Uh, I have to say, it, it now it crashes a lot on my Galaxy S3 and just crashed again. Uh, yeah. So it's got... Yeah, my, I, I, I tried it on the Nexus 7 and I found it's just not reliable on that at all. Yeah, they even say specifically it's, it is for phones, not tablets. But uh, of course, the Nexus yeah. 7 is Wi-Fi only, so it wouldn't be particularly useful. Yeah. Well, they, they do download uh, a lot of the content. It's not it's not a streaming oh. thing specifically. Ah. It's kind of, according to Hanky, it's a mix. That was and another it, question. Somebody in the chat room said, boy, this is a great way to go through your data caps, burn through your data caps. Could be. Certainly, if, you, uh, if you're downloading sound files, you could... Right. Uh, you could uh, run up a tab pretty quickly. But if it if it um, if it caches uh, when you're on Wi-Fi, for instance, that would be that would be that would be great. This um, this of course is another way that Google's going to use Zagat because they bought the Zagat guides, and this really is a great use for that. Yep. Um, mm -hmm. 
It's, it's, you got to you got to remember it's not just look up stuff. It's it's really just useful when you're moving about and you're in you know a, a new area particularly. Right. right. Yeah. It's got architecture, so, historic places, uh, and events, lifestyle offers and deals, food, drinks, and fun. Cool and unique and outdoor art are the current categories, but there'll be more, I'm sure, added. It's interesting. The Public Art Archive, Chicago Public Art, Friends of the High Line, which is New York, uh, L.A. Public Art, Laguna Beach, Stanford Public Art, and San Francisco Mural Project. So you can see those places, public art, you know, if you're going around Chicago, you'll, you'll, you know, you'll see all the interesting public art. But, uh-huh. uh, but it wouldn't work in, uh, in let's say, uh, Philadelphia. They do have a kind of in the, in the lifestyle section. I think they have a uh, uh, gardenista, matador network, inhabitant, <laughs> racked, remodelista, curbed, Charlie, we heart, song yeah. kick, creative loafing. Yeah, song kick, for instance, said, oh, across the street, uh, some group is going to play on Friday. It picked, mm-hmm. it picked that up as I walked by. Sunset Magazine, Flavor Pill. Interesting. It all, it all kind of fits into that Google, you know, goggles. Yeah. Hey, I got to run. Great to talk to you, Rick. Thank you, Leo. See ya. Bye. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. 8888 Ask Leo. That's the number. If you've got a question, a comment, a suggestion, we got a few more minutes before this show wraps itself up for the weekend. I think this this Google app is is more than just an app. I think it really is a uh, an indicator as to where Google wants to go and why Android is so important to Google going forward. And and Apple, I'm sure, will do the same thing because you, and and this is the challenge, for instance, for companies like Facebook. One of the reasons Facebook stock has plummeted is because uh, Facebook makes money on the ads when you use the website. But more and more people are using Facebook, now more than half of the people who use Facebook, on mobile, where there are no ads. And, and, and we already know that banner ads on mobile, the kinds of ads that you see on websites, really don't work. So, the, so, the, so people are, rightly so, I think, th- saying, well, well uh, uh, how are you going to make money, Facebook, if, if more and more people are using it on mobile? And your current monetization plan, your current way of making money, doesn't include mobile. Clearly, Google is thinking hard about how do you make money on smartphones. And this is a, I, you know, this is the kind of thing where it, it is the best of both worlds. Yeah, Google has to make money. They, they, these companies can't offer you these services for free. They have to m- monetize it. But it should be a fair trade. I should be getting something for giving them information about where I am and and letting them show me an ad about, you know, a good deal on pants or a buck off coffee, I should be getting something else. And this field trip is a good example of really some great value. It turns everything as you walk around or drive around into a field trip where you get information about the, your surroundings. That's really cool. That's really interesting. Then, okay, occasionally I'll see an ad for coffee and maybe even I'll take advantage of it. That's not so bad. Leslie is in Los Angeles. She's our next caller, or he. Hi, Leslie. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Leo. I love your show. Thank you. Um, I, um, I have a problem. I keep getting that, this window from Microsoft telling me that I need to close, that there's something wrong with my Internet Explorer. Um, whenever I go to a site, it pops up, and it says... Uh, click at the bottom of it to send an error report or not to send. <laughs> yeah, don't send an error report. <laughs> I mean, you can if you want. So what's happening is Internet Explorer is crashing. And uh, that may be why sometimes people jocularly call it Internet Exploder. Uh, okay. it, it crashes, but all browsers do crash because the web is an unpredictable place and sometimes uh, a browser has to work harder than it can. Um, my suggestion, are you using, what version of Internet Exploder, I mean Explorer, are you using? Um, XP. Okay. And, and I'm technically challenged, have, so... No, no, that's, please, <laughs> people apologize. You should never apologize. That's okay. your, I will not assume that you are a uh, a computer programmer, but at the same time, you shouldn't be apologetic. This <laughs> stuff shouldn't be so hard to use. 
just it just pops up and even on my email sometimes when i'm going just to looking at my email all of a sudden it pops up and says i'm sorry we have to close and then yeah. i click it to close and it'll come back and says the tab was recovered <laughs> and it comes back you first might have of all first I'm actually on the computer now trying to like yeah. read the window to you but of course now that i'm talking you to won't you, do it first of all i want to i want to make sure leslie that you're using the most recent version of Internet Explorer. You should be on IE9. Now, I know this is hard for you to know. Do you run Windows updates regularly? Do I get what? Do you run the Windows updates regularly? No. Okay. So that's a big problem. I'm going to scold you now. Oh, you mean like at the end when you're closing? No. Well, yeah. You know, that's what... Yeah. So you see that every once in a while. Oh, Windows has updates. Yeah. Okay. So that means your Windows updates are automatic updates are turned on. Thank goodness. Right. Thank goodness. <laughs> uh, because if you don't have that turned on, uh, oh, you got lots of problems. Those those updates patch v vulnerabilities in the system, and and it, and Microsoft does this monthly. And when those patches go out, it's a signal to hackers. Hey, we got a problem in this area, and hackers will start attacking. So you want to, you want those updates the minute they come out. If okay. you're getting those updates, I, here's what I would suggest you do: run Windows Update and see, make sure that you've got the latest Internet Explorer. It will not uh, normally force you to update, but it will it will say, hey, you know, you really ought to be using IE eight by now. So IE eight. Eight. Yeah. Let, let's okay. go with that one. Uh, yeah, I think that's what. I, I should have that. Yeah, okay. And then the other option is just not to use IE8, but to use a different browser. You know, there are many choices, and a, a one that I particularly like is from Google. It's called Chrome. Okay. And I, I would try installing that. You can get that, Go just run Internet Explorer, and if it doesn't crash on you, go to google.com slash chrome. That's free. Okay. Now, it may be that in browsing around, you've accidentally installed a, a browser helper object or a plug-in or a toolbar that's causing these problems. It shouldn't crash all the time. That's yeah, not Yeah, that could be it. Yeah. So I would also, uh, first of all, using Chrome will eliminate that because you won't be using IE anymore. But I would also go and look at IE and uninstall any extensions that you don't know what they are. Get rid of. Okay. You know? Um, they're telling me in the chat room, and they're quite right, you cannot use IE9 because of XP. You have to use IE8, but that IE8 is better than the previous IE. version. So, okay. you, yeah, you should make sure you have IE8. Um, and then uh, do me a favor, and if you do the updates, that's great. Every once in a while after you do an update, it's the second Tuesday of every month, I want you to run Microsoft's malicious software removal tool. Uh, they got that MRT thing? Yeah. yeah I did that because that was what... I talked to Microsoft, uh, Microsoft one time over the phone to try to um, alleviate this problem, and they told me to run that. Good. And literally, I did it, and it worked for about 10 minutes. Yes. And then when I tried to call them back, um, like another day about it, I was told that I could only do any kind of tech support online with them yeah. talking to someone. Yeah, once a month or something. You have to pay and for I, it, yeah. But uh, no, MRT will take a long time because it's scanning the whole hard drive. 10 minutes is nothing. <laughs> it may take longer, but what you want to do is let it run until it completes. But I did. I let the whole thing, it, it did it, and I and thought you, it... And it didn't say there were any uh, bugs on there. Yeah, it said I was I was good. Yay! Yeah. <laughs> Yay. So I would just look, make sure you don't, if you have toolbars on there, take them off. Those toolbars may be crashing, i.e. IE should not crash by itself. Okay. But you could also use Google Chrome and uh, and eliminate that, I would suspect. Okay, but you think I should run the Windows, I should run um, the updates again, though, like on my own? It wouldn't hurt. And if you run updates, it'll. if you have an older version of IE, it will I say, know. oh, by the way, we could update Internet Explorer for you. Okay. They push it on you. You can see which version of Internet Explorer you have if you just check. Uh, it's. It's. Uh, I think it's about, the About menu item, I believe. Okay. You want to be using IE8. But I think you can also use Chrome, and, you know, IE does not go away, but Chrome is a little bit better. Um, toolbars I don't like. When people say, when programs say, hey, would you like to install the, uh, you know, the XYZ, just say no. Let's not, let's not burden our browsers even more. Uh, let's see, I think I have time for one more if I hurry. Kathy in Laurel, Missouri. Oh, I don't have time. There's the magic sound. Darn it, Kathy. So close. We'll make you the first call next week.
Thanks for joining me. Have a great Geek Week. I am Leo Laporte, the Tech Guy. Well, that's it for the Tech Guy show for today. I'm Leo Laporte. Thank you so much for joining us. Don't forget, the Tech Guy is just the tip of the iceberg. We do nearly 30 shows now on the Twit Netcast Network, and you'll find them all at twit.tv. We talk about Windows and Windows Weekly, Macintosh and Mac Break Weekly, iPad on iPad Today. You get your daily dose of tech news from Tech News Today and our weekly roundtable show This Week in Tech. It's all at twit.tv. And I'll be back next time with another great Tech Guy podcast. Thanks for joining me. See you next time.